The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this fly come. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. It is time to keep your appointment. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill episode 134. <sighs> Little brain had to step up the stones. I was like Mario. You know, fall down a tunnel. How are you? Oh, I'm Gav. You're, who are you? <laughs> I'm Dan. How are you? Um, yeah, good. Good. Very well. Thank you. Happy to be here again, listeners. We're, we are fucking knocking them out of the park. We're uh, knocking them out left, right and centre. You know, Mama said knock you out, and anything else that says knock you out, we're knocking them out. A lady's love call, James, did say, Mama said knock you out. It's funny that one day he's sitting in his kitchen, and his mum just says, fucking knock him out. What? Knock him out, James. Come on, go out there and knock him out. So LL Cool J goes out there, and he says, Mama said knock you out, and fucking gets on it. I'd love to have been there the day when he... He's about 14 years old, and uh, he was rapping, and someone said, so what's your rap name going to be? And he's like, LL Cool J, and they're going to be like, what does it stand for? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, funny you should ask, it stands for Ladies Love Cool James, because my name's James, and I'm cool, and you the know, ladies you love know, me. He was probably like nine or ten when he came up with that, <laughs> and then it's kind of like your, your first email address, and later oh. on you're like, oh, yeah, I know it says uh, Hot's orgasm 69 or something do you know me at hotmail or whatever that isn't my email so don't email that in <laughs> or email that and see what comes back to you anyway you never know anyway this is episode 134 of the podcast on Honored Hill as Gav said we always go on tangents we're known for our tangents this episode is a special episode though Gav because da, 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 it's another patron pick <sighs> patron pick patron pick we should this do a sound bite really we should we should make one up actually mm. yeah we'll do one mm. um, well this episode our patron with the crown as we like to wear and put an imaginary crown on the patron who's running the episode is Kevin S. Fife. Yes. Kevin thank you very much for being our patron and uh, for sending in your email which we'll read out in bits and bobs throughout this show thank and you, for Kevin. selecting the and movies yeah definitely selecting my favourite my favourite spooky house movie yeah so well let's tell everybody what Kevin selected you already know because you've clicked the thumbnail but <clears throat> as is tradition Kevin has selected for us to listen to that's uh, for us to review sorry The Legacy from 1978 uh, with uh, uh, Roger Daltrey pops up that one, doesn't <laughs> yeah, he? Yeah, he does. Um, and obviously know. Sam Elliott with his incredible moustache of steel. Um, and, yes, as Gav said, 1980s, fantastic, classic, George C. Scott starring The Changeling. Mm, great movie. Two, a uh, great pairing, actually, both oh, take place in, in spooky houses. So, um, some great stuff to talk about there and obviously as always we will read kevin's email as to why he selected it uh those movies what he remembers about them what, the first time he watched them and a few other things he wants to say which is brilliant uh, yeah, so we'll come to that in a moment that's good so here we are gav what have we been up to well let me kick things off by talking about kicking because the kickstarter for our deadbolt films Star Wars fan film Sanctuary Moon dun, 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 dun. it's finished and we made it just didn't yeah, we we did indeed um, which is great so thank you so much for the people who have contributed towards that and we are going to make like the best fucking thing we can possibly make we are so stoked for this behind the scenes it is just starting to get really tight and really like you can start seeing stuff like the weapons and the shit and it's gonna be like man this is gonna be good yeah it's uh it's very exciting stuff as everything's coming together and um just need to get some catering 
<laughs> it's gonna be. It's gonna be. Well, well, yeah. I'll make some sandwiches. It's fine. Yeah, it's not shadow of death for the cheese sandwiches. <laughs> but yeah, we're shooting that Good Friday, so you know, it's going to be going on YouTube. It won't be going on to uh, f- festivals, um, I don't think, unless there's a special Star Wars fan film festival, then we would. But um, we can, we still will have like a YouTube premiere at some point. But that's going to be a couple of months after we've, um, two three months after we've uh, um, wrapped. Yes. Rap, rap, rap. But it's really exciting, comrades. So thank you very much for doing that, Dan. What have you been up to? I listened to a book. Oh, an audio book. Another yes. one. Uh, it's a book I'd already read many years ago, but now I have this. Uh, I've got these free credits with Audible mm. um, on Prime. Um, so I decided I would listen to choreography, which is. For those that don't know, I've Corey Feldman's uh, book. Now I've read it myself as well. Um, oh, but you've like used it. I guaranteed he is the voice of it. Of course he is. That's why I chose to listen to it, because it's him. And he does, when he's going through his life, he does impressions of... So he does... A, this Michael Jackson impression he does is so scarily spot on. Yeah, it, uh, seeing videos of him the other day, like, what? what I don't... What is going on with the, his, <laughs> his music acts where he's just uh, replicating uh, Michael Jackson? I don't understand. Well, he, he what, talks what, about why? it in his biography. Um, yeah, well, I've read the biography, but what, and I bet at home he just sits there trying to do Michael Jackson impressions all the time. And he's very adamant Michael Jackson didn't do anything to him. But yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a strange situation because Michael Jackson was then obviously uh, people are accused of doing things which we never find out true or false and then the Corey did have things done to him but never d- like that you know Her- I'm not Her- saying he he did I'm, I'm not getting any thing like that you know fucking hell Her- hearing him narrate his life story this time around had a lot more impact emotion- yeah, yeah a lot yeah. more emotional impact actually yeah. and I was actually crying there was two parts of it that made me very teary um uh, you know, and he, t- he talks about River Phoenix, and he talks about all these things that have happened. And then it's, some of it's very funny as well, like him getting almost getting fired from the Lost Boys, and then, well, he did get fired, and then they rehired him the next day. And then obviously, the reason he wears sunglasses in every scene on the Burbs is because he was just falling asleep due to cocaine. Uh, it's just incredible, really, that the stuff he's gone through. Uh, to, to be fair, if he's, he's a coke addict on the Burbs. I love his character on the Burbs. Yeah, he, well, I mean, I love Corey Feldman, and he's been he's been through a lot. I would, wouldn't want to trade places with him. I wouldn't want to be him. It's really dark when he starts talking about the other Corey and, and, and going into the hotel room with the dude and stuff. And yeah. it's like, oh my god, that's hard to read. Yeah. Mm. But um, I just wanted to mention that um, if you know, it's, it's been out many years now. But if any, nobody's read it, and you know, if Gav and I are big fans of Corey Feldman. Check out choreography. It. it you know, it, whether you believe some of the stuff or not, I, I genuinely believe him. I do think there is an awful he's very adamant still, He's very passionately adamant still, like it, uh, uh, it happened. You know. Indeed. And let's quickly talk about, sorry, I've just realised, talking about him, the Goonies, Ki Hui Kwan, who played Data in the Goonies, also played Short Round in Indiana Jones, it won an Oscar I, yeah, I didn't even know everything was going everywhere on. all at once. Mm, I heard this, yeah. Uh, which is incredible. Um, in fact, four of my sort of childhood slash teenage heroes won Oscars. So Jamie Lee Curtis won an Oscar, um, which we, we all love her from Halloween. She's, you know, but for, for many other things as well. Uh, Michelle Yeoh won an Oscar, who I know from all the Jackie Chan movies, but also recently has appeared in things like Crouching Tiger, etc., etc. Uh, Brand- Brendan Fraser from The Mummy and Joy to the Jungle. You know, I love The the Mummy, the Stephen Summers Mummy, Mummy movie. He won an Oscar. And then Ki Hoi Kwan won an Oscar too. So it's incredible that these people, after many, many years of slogging away in the industry... Mm. Some of them even having really bad journeys and vanishing off the scene and coming back. They've all won an Oscar. I just wanted to mention that. A segue to that. Cameron Diaz is doing a movie again. She retired in like 2012. She and, did. And right this moment, well, today and tomorrow, they're shooting in the Bourne Woods, her and Jamie Foxx. Ah. I'm not down there, I've been told. Um, I'm too busy to go and have a look. But yeah, they're down there filming, apparently. That's interesting. Weird. Oh, yeah, yeah, she retired to have children, didn't she? I don't know, um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, you've been watching anything good? Uh, I finished Midnight Mass. It's good, isn't it? 
Very, yeah. very, very good. I guess don't spoil it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going to. I wouldn't. It's, it's a good TV show. Yeah. <laughs> and you're right in a sort of Salem's lot sort of vein. Just sort of can leave it like that without too much of a spoiler. But Yeah, I really enjoyed it though. I, and I, I, I enjoyed I do, it. You know, I will definitely watch anything that Mike Flanagan does. He's one of those names now for me. Um... Uh, I've got a couple other things to talk about, but let's. What, what have you been up to? Have you? Is there anything on your list that you've watched? Have you been doing any cinema trips? No cinema. Uh, oh no, I did do a cinema trip. I went with Sarah. Oh, what was it? Oh, fucking cocaine bear! God damn, that was, oh. shit was the fucking best. I love that shit. I've heard a lot of good things. It, I've heard that it's not a great movie, but no. it's, it's but it it's just. A, <laughs> lot of fun see when I, I started going then that's amazing blah 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 then you sort of think about it and go yeah there's bits it's not as not incredible but I really 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 enjoyed it and definitely still wear over in my DVD collection um, there's some really really good fun set pieces in it and just really fun stuff like the, the kids in it doing coke and shit it's just funny stuff going on in the movie which is just makes you laugh it's very ent- entertaining and it's a nice uh, send off for Ray Liotta as well yeah, it's his last movie, which is mm. odd. Mm. Um, I think, not that I've even seen it yet, but I suspect we will cover it in a few years' time and double bill it with Grizzly, because why not? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, I would say that, definitely. Um, so, I sold... <laughs> so, you know, on my birthday, I bought those, all those Blu-ray movies, but I sold I sold some of them on the internet, and then I sold... Because um, I kept the ones that I wanted. It was really nice to replace and upgrade some of my DVDs and stuff, like Science of Lambs and Shawshank Redemption. It's like, oh, amazing, you know. And, but the stuff I didn't want. Um, i still got a Serbian film, still sitting in my collection. It's there. It's, it's on a, Blu-ray. I know, it's on the top shelf. It's actually a top shelf DVD um, Blu-ray. But I'm like, I need to sell it, but I don't know how you sell that, because it's not anywhere to sell <laughs> It's good because it's a bit under the shelf territory, isn't it? Under the counter, mm. old school eighties type. Oh, I've got anything good for me? And but anyway, I sold I sold all the rest of the box of movies to a Hungarian guy at quarter past seven the other morning. Turned up in his big white van. His mate is uh, picking up some stuff in England and taking it back to Hungary. So he took all his movies with him, and I just chuck, I chucked loads more DVDs and Blu-rays in there. So I said, I've just ch- filled up this box of movies for you. There you go, go for it. Um, but then that morning, about 10 minutes later, someone put up uh, 200 Blu-rays going for 25 quid, so I went and picked them up. Oh, God. And uh, started going for all those. And um, I, I was just like, well, I've taken out 35 quid for that guy, £25 for 200 Blu-rays. And I realised when I was chatting to the lady, she just said, oh, people have come and, um, friends and family have sort of come and take what they want. Uh, they are my husband, sort of thing like that. And I was like, OK, thanks very much. And she said, the money's going to charity. I was like, oh, OK. Um, I didn't really think about it, and I was like, oh, this must have been his collection, and he's passed away. And yeah. that, so I looked around at my collection, and I was like, well, uh, all right, guys, so this is what's going to happen to you one day. Someone's going <laughs> to get you for a cheap price and do whatever they want with you. You know, I was just like, well, so it's such a sort of just a, yeah, you know, we're here, and then we're not here. You know, it's just a, it's a weird thing, but maybe think about that. But anyway, I found Salo in it. So her husband has Salo in his Blu-ray collection. Yeah, that's pretty... It's not. It's, it's an odd film to have on Blu-ray. It fucking is! 120 Days of... Sodomy. It's called. Sodomy or Sodom. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have seen it before as well, but I'm not going to watch it. Um, but yeah, so going through that, I find out some bits and bobs, and I got used some movies and things like that. And um, I was going to sell some of those, but I was going to get hold of it and find out what charity she gave money to, then I was going to put some more money towards the charity. Because I only realised it was like her husband's collection, do you know what I mean? And she yeah. sold it to me for next to nothing. And if I hadn't got it, someone else would have got it. But so sometimes I'd... it's just good to... Yeah, well, I was going to give some more money to charity, I think. Cause it's Clear out, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And she's probably like, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Type of I turned up, the house was massive. I literally turned up and said, do you want a bigger house? That's what I said to myself when I got out of the car. So she's just like, oh, I've got all these... T- oh, I heard my back bring them down. I said, I don't know if I can carry them for you. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I've been doing that, so I just, and Sarah's like, you need some sort of Blu-ray intervention. What's going on with you at the moment? I said, I don't know. I said, I might contact the Hungarian guy and say, do you want to buy some more? Come back over. <laughs> it might be some sort of Hungarian Blu-ray smuggler or, or a dealer or something. I don't know. Amazing. I don't know. Exporter to Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Let's get those I copies of The Shadow of Death when it comes out. I don't have a segue 
I, you, you don't. I don't. Uh, do you want to get into the actual uh, reviews? Uh, yeah, well, let me talk about the last couple of bits, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I rewatched One Cut of the Dead. Good film, isn't it? I'd only seen it once. Loved it. Watched it the second time. Really love it. Oh, Gab's neighbour is shouting again. I can hear him in the background. Yeah, if anyone's not seen One Cut of the Dead, I recommend. I'm not going to spoil it. Go watch it immediately. Um, it's an awesome movie. It's not a one, not a oneer or a one taker. As some people like to say half is. Half of it is, but it's an incredible movie. Very uplifting, and one of the most original zombie films I've probably ever seen. It's, um, it's yeah. Uh, if it hadn't been zombie and doing something else, it'd just been that. It's just that concept is so cool. I love that. But it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Um, Jay really enjoyed it as well. If you like zombies, you'll you'll like it. If you like filmmaking and and sort of guerrilla budget filmmaking, you'll really like it as well. Uh, and then there's like a weird bit in the middle, which is kind of like a bit of a family drama, which feels stupid and weird and out of place. But it it when you get to the end credits, it all just makes sense and you understand it. I'm just remembering, I'm just kind of thinking about movie and what my mind just went straight to is the guy needs to poop. Yeah, so he's like, I can't, I can't drink um, this type of water because it, <laughs> it irritates my bowels. And then uh, he drinks it, and he's walking around, and they're like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, oh. and then he goes off and sits in the bushes. But and because he's I supposed think... to be a zombie, in about a minute's time, the woman's trying to put makeup on him while he's doing his shit in the bushes. <laughs> And he's going to her, I'm so sorry about this. And she's going, she's holding her nose, going, oh, the director's going, quickly, hurry up, because he's going to be on screen in a minute. Just, I feel so sorry for that guy. Oh, man, it's so he's fucking sweating. funny. He's sweating so much. Oh, I saw so that. Bad. Yeah, I wet myself. It's so good. <laughs> the fact that the camera runs past and she's putting makeup on the dude. He's shit. He's like, I'm so sorry. He's saying sorry about all this shit's come pouring up with out of him. I know, it's very good. It's, it's very so funny. funny. Mm. Um, and the other movie I watched, uh, which I do want to talk about briefly, is Scream 5. Finally watched it, because I know Scream 6 is now out in cinemas. Mm. Scream 5. So, uh, I absolutely fucking loved it. I actually think it's the best Scream movie since Scream 1. Um and I thought it was a, the script, especially, and the ideas, and the con. Because what I like about the Scream movies is Scream One is obviously it's meta about slashers. Scream Two is about sequels. Scream Three is the end of the trilogy. So each movie is so meta in where it is. And this one is I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why they'd made another one. I didn't understand why it was just called Scream and not Scream Five or Five Cream, as I like to call it. Um, but it's because it's a requel or a legacy sequel, which they get into. They get into all of that stuff, Halloween and all these other movies that have come out recently that, that have the same name as the original and it's just i just find it really interesting but side by side with that it was brutal the murders were because scream murders are so brutal aren't they because they're just knives mm. there's something about that it's not a monster or anything it's just someone slicing and dicing mm. um and i just thought it was really original and the most of the cast were I, I didn't like any of them but you're not supposed to in a scream or any slasher movie but most of them were interesting enough that i cannot wait to watch scream six to be honest with you it made me fall back in love because the last couple of scream movies were a bit mm, especially four i didn't i don't really remember four to be honest with you I remember uh, four quite well. I saw, f I've seen all of them in cinema, apart from the recent one, and I don't remember. I didn't like five, and I don't remember anything of it. And I saw it in the cinema. Um, I have to go back to watch it again and try and give it a bit more of a chance. I thought you said. See, I remember you saying you liked it, but you couldn't remember much about it. Mm -hmm. I to, I'm going to have to watch it again because I am a massive Scream fan, uh, yeah. and that's a segue to the next podcast that Sarah and I are doing, which is the Gainesville Killer. Uh, Ripper from um, uh, Inspiration for Wes Craven for the Scream. We're covering that on the High Strangeness podcast um, this weekend, which we'll be doing. Um, which is a fucking gnarly case because he is gnarly with a knife, knifing people in the backs and shit, just really foot on. And that's probably why Wes Craven got the inspiration because his anger in this dude, <laughs> you know. So and it's kind of kind of like Ghostface in the way it is with a knife, you know. It's very violent. Anyway, um, yeah. What else you watch? Anything else? 
Uh, one other thing relating to that, talking to podcasts, mm. I recently had the pleasure of guesting on Ricky Morgan's show. If anybody's not heard uh, Dr. Movie, um, Ricky Morgan, our Legion brother, does a show called Dr. Movie. He's done many shows over the years, uh, <laughs> as we like to say, but um, he is... I think he's hit 100 episodes now of Doctor Movie, just over, uh, which is a show where he talks in his car about a movie that he's watched recently. Uh, it can be anything. It can be 70s, 80s, horror, action, Smoking the Bandit, whatever it might be, he, he'll he just review it, and it's about 15 minutes per episode. He asked me recently if I'd like to appear on the show. I love getting together with Ricky, so I said yes. He didn't get in his car with him. I wish I could have gone over to America and got in his car, but uh, we didn't do that. But we did discuss, and I can reveal this because the sh- his episode will be out by the time this one comes out, uh, Masters of the Universe from 1987 with Dolph Lundgren, as everybody knows, I'm a huge He-Man fan. Mm-hmm. So it was a pleasure to jump on and discuss that with Ricky. Um, I also recorded an extra episode, which I won't reveal uh, yet, because that isn't going to be out for a few weeks, and that'll be a nice little surprise episode when it comes out. Do you give that He-Man movie a thumbs up? Always. <laughs> it's pretty sketchy, isn't it? Uh, it is, but it's fun. It's, it, it was a canon movie. It was one of the last canon yeah. movies. Dolph Lundgren's big breakout Did, role. Didn't Sylvester Stallone appear on the set and say, you give that guy lines? Yeah, he said you gave that guy lines. And Dolph Lundgren hated that film for many years until he realised he went to a couple of um, He-Man conventions and realised just how many people really love, genuinely love that film and it's part of their childhood. And he's realised all these years he's had this massive following because of He-Man. You know, and Frank Langella that played Skeletor, it's his favourite movie of his career, and he's an Oscar winning actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because his kids said, Go on, Dad, play Skeletor when he was in the eighties and he was like, All right, I'll I'll do the I'll do it. And that's what and he's like a Shakespearean actor, so that's why Skeletor in it is so amazing because he's delivering all these lines. I don't know. It's got, I don't it's remember got remember Meg Skeletor Foster in it. Yeah, I remember Meg Foster being in it, yeah. It's got um Strickland from uh, Back to the Futures in it. She was always for me on Sky Movies and Meg Foster and she'll always be the lady with those eyes. That's yeah. all I knew it was. I didn't know her that's name. What, that's what me and Ricky talked about, you know, she she's definitely got those crazy eyes. But yeah, so I, I had the pleasure of doing that. So look out for Doctor Movie. Me and Ricky Morgan talking about the Masters of the Universe movie. The last thing to mention before we get into our patron's email is another patron, Don. Um, We've had some issues over in the UK with uh, the Royal Mail, the postal services. So I know that you're waiting on your T-shirt. I'm really sorry. There's been so many postal strikes here. No, um, uh, Sarah says it it can be done. I haven't got it the way she's done it, where you can get a post person to come to your house and collect the parcel. Mm. Um, um, I tried. You can't post anything to the States from a post office because of digital hijack or some shit. I don't know. Some digital thing happened. So even if we have to get in our own private jet and fly the T-shirt to you, Don, we Look, will get it to you somehow. i tell you what, I'll get at least six pigeons and sew them <laughs> together. Oh, my God. We'll make, like, some special delivery which can go overseas. Put little hats on them. They'd be kind of be like the human centipede, but the human pigeon peed. Oh, my God. And they will fly the T-shirt to you. I don't know how they know their addresses. We'll have to work out some computer <laughs> navigation system on them. I don't know. Just buy a drone. It's probably going to be cheaper. It's going to be easier, but it's a long way to go over a drone. How's that going to keep power? We need pigeon power. Don't How fly a drone over America at the moment either. back up for the uh, power for the uh, drone. Pigeon drones. I wouldn't recommend flying a drone over America right now. Probably not. No, that's they're true. Getting, they're getting shot down left, right and centre, aren't they? Yes. Right. Okay. Right, well, shall we get into Kevin's email? Our patron, our king patron, Kevin. Yeah. <clears throat> and we can um, hear into a bit films, about him. Yeah. And then we can get into the films. I'm looking forward yeah. to this double bill. It's a good one, guys. Um, <laughs> if you haven't good. seen these films, do check them out. Like I said, my favourite Haunted House movie is The Changeling. And it's great to review because I found stuff that I hadn't really seen before because I didn't never reviewed it before. Mm. Okay, well, here is Kevin's email. He says, Hello, hello from Louisville, Kentucky. Now, I, Kevin, on a side note, I've wanted to make sure I pronounced Louisville correctly because 
I know. It's not Louisville, I've heard, is it? I've heard people say Louisville. I've heard people say Louisville. Easy E says Louisville Slugger. Yeah, it's well, it's Louisville is what, is what I've heard. Oh, okay. So, some people say Louisville as well. But Easy we'll talks now, about Kentucky. bashing someone's brains in with his Louis, Louis, Louisville Slugger. Louisville. Yeah, that sounds like he. That sounds like he's. That's, that's, that's what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what's going on there. Well, he continues. It's home of the Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby, uh, coming up in May, by the way, and home to all things bur- uh, bourbon, bourbon and Coke, bourbon neat. Bourbon barbecue sauce, bourbon chocolates, bourbon seasonings, and so on and so on. Lots and lots of bourbon. I do like a good bourbon. Well, used to. Yeah. It's a good flavour, though. I still like it in barbecue sauce and stuff. I actually had a non-alcoholic bourbon uh, somewhere, and it was pretty good. Mm. Mm. Okay. He says, so, how are you, Dan and Gav? Or Gav and Dan? I love you both equally, and I don't want either of you to be upset with the order. Is it D&G or (laughs) G&D? We don't mind, do we? We're easy. We don't mind who, yeah, we're easy. Easy like Sunday mornings, we are. He, he continues, I adore your show and I adore you both. Thank That's you. Very kind of you. I totally appreciate it. I love all you patrons because, uh, yeah, I totally appreciate it, so thank you. He says, I appreciate so much about the programme, but it is your friendship and love for each other as best friends that I really love. Not to mention the show format and covering some of my all-time favourite movies. He says, as a gay male who has been out since 17 in 1988, wow. I, appreci- yeah, yeah. I appreciate how inclusive you both are. Uh, not just with the LGBTQIA++++, I'm quoting him here, community, but with all marginalised groups. I love that as straight males, you can be so openly appreciative of handsome and attractive males in movies, and you don't shy mm. away from saying things like, he is a fucking hot man, I would do him. <laughs> I do say that. I do say that. Yeah, I, it's really weird. Okay, uh, nowadays you can look at a man when watching a movie. Nowadays, and I'm like, yeah, he's before a hot guy. I don't, I don't. I think I don't want to bum him, but you know, I'm sort of looking at it as like he's an attractive guy. I can see that. So, and I, I think he might be of age. We just kind of don't care anymore, just, or something. I don't know. I don't know. He also says, or oh, you bring up Kevin Bacon's junk very often, which I do. Dan does. I don't. He says, so thank you. Thanks for being straight males, comfortable in your straightness. Um, He says, you also have me laughing out loud when you're making yourselves laugh or when you get tickled about something. It's hilarious. Uh, And you even have me screaming at my stereo sometimes when you ramble on about something with with incorrect facts. Like recently, Dan was saying that a movie was released in the 90s and it was 40 years old. I was screaming, no, it's 30, 30 years old. He was talking about true romance there because my maths brain was completely incorrect there. He said, it's too funny. I love all these moments. That's so cool. My my neighbour's so loud. Fuck's sake. And let's not forget how hard I laugh at your impressions of Nick Cage, Liam Neeson and Donald Pleasance. Also all (laughs) hilarious. Anyway, enough of that. I clearly love you both. Well, we love you, Kevin. That's a brilliant start to an email, and uh, fantastic to hear that we're entertaining to you. Yeah, no, I do appreciate it. I'm glad we play lots of, uh, g- uh, do lots of good films that you like. And yes, we do ramble on with uh, wrong facts. <laughs> yes, always correct us. I get wrong. Having... I have wrong words at times. I make words up, so you know. It's also lovely to hear you say that you feel that we're inclusive. We do, we do try, but we also don't try. If that makes sense, I, I like to think that Gav and I are just naturally that way. But we uh, do also yeah. try to make sure that we aren't being offensive to anybody. When Dan and I are not on the microphone, this is just how Dan and I are. It's, yeah. it's literally we're, no different. Well, I think it's probably quite obvious that really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, let's carry on with his email. He says, "Where to begin? Okay, I was born July fifteenth, nineteen seventy. Oh wait, that's probably too early. <laughs> Th- this guy's this guy's funny. I like, I like it. it. I, 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 like I, was, I was about to say, go, hey, what's going on here? This is Forrest <laughs> Gump or something? He says. Yeah. Okay, let's flash forward a few years. I would soon find myself watching horror movies with my dad. He died in 2020. And we continued to discuss horror movies all these years. He regularly took me to the drive-in to see classics like The Amityville Horror, Terror, Godsend, The Omen 2, Halloween, The Creature Creature from the Black Lake, and Legacy. I was about to say drive, not the drive through drive-in. That sounds amazing. I've still not done a drive-in. And and sorry Uh, to hear about your father. 
uh, to name just a few. Uh, then HBO came along, and back then it was only on from 2 p.m. till 2 a.m., so we watched. Uh, we began watching horror throughout the week. He would let me stay up late, and I'd be so scared sitting up next to him on the couch. Anyway, I share all that to say that I got my horror super fix, my horror fix super early, and I've been an uber fan ever since. Lucky enough to have my teenage years in the 80s. The 80s slashers are my fave genre, and I kind of... I'm in uh, agreement there, Kevin. I, you know, they're one of my absolute favourites. But he says, but honestly, I love them all. Creature features, haunted houses, highbrow horror, survival, home invasion, supernatural, sci-fi family, so on, 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 on. So, I chose these two movies for a couple of reasons. Both have beautifully creepy mansions. Both have a very few what-the-fuck moments that cause me nightmares then and throughout these years since, and scenes that I continue to think about today. They both have wonderful movie posters. They both have stellar casts. They both have sinister vibes that get under your skin long after the movies are over. They both deal with family and loss. They both have a gothic feel to them and great endings or big reveals. So honestly, despite my love of other subgenres, both these movies have made decades-long impressions on me, and I love my father dearly for introducing them to me. Amazing. Great start to the email. We'll read the rest out, obviously, um, when we come to, to the movies, because you've, um, obviously, you've, you've written your little blurbs about the movies, Kevin. But thank you so much for being so open and honest and telling us all about that. Um, Kevin and I actually messaged privately a little bit when I received this just because his story about his dad reminded me a bit of the story of my mum because me and my mum would always watch the horror channel and obviously I lost her the year before Kevin lost his dad so there was like a little mm. little parallel there so we sort of mm. gave each other a fist bump across the uh, oceans as it were um, but yeah amazing well we're really excited so we're going to start with Legacy aren't we Gav yep um, so everybody if you're as excited as this is your chance to catch your breath and thank you for the writing as well and patrons don't be pressured when it comes your turn and your time to choose you don't have to write something i don't want you listening to going oh no in the panic it's yeah, okay you, you even if you say, have nothing to say these are my picks we go yeah cool yeah, that's fine you know, Honestly, it doesn't just, matter just say. but yeah thank you for that okay that's that's wicked um, um yeah, cool. Should we get into a trailer for the legacy? Yes, indeed. Sam Elliott's moustache is still dark. It's not grey yet. No, but it's still that hell of a moustache. One hell of a moustache. Um, all right, check out this trailer. <laughs> Jason Mount Olive is a man with many friends. Jason will give you such wealth. To each he has given anything. He will fulfill every whim. And everything. With every fancy. They've ever desired. Every dream. Trust Jason. Now they've been reunited for one last time. <laughs> each to receive one last gift. The legacy. When he calls us, we come. <laughs> Six have come to claim his inheritance. Five discover the lifeless body. Four watch in horror as another dies. Then there were three. Then two. But only one can receive the legacy. Catherine Ross. Sam Elliott. And Roger Daltrey. The legacy. A birthright of living death. The legacy, uh, the first pick from Kevin, our king patron of the episode from 1978. Here's the synopsis. So an American couple in England stumble upon a rambling mansion where a number of powerful individuals have been summoned by its patriarch regarding the home's legacy. And as always, we will read out Kevin's little paragraph about this movie as well. Uh, he says... The Legacy. It's a birthright of living death, which is the tagline on the poster. It says moody, scary, excellent death set pieces, and it instilled a lifelong fear in me while being in a pool. I think about every time I'm in a swimming pool to this day. 
Not to mention the isolated, creepy estate with roads that go nowhere except back to the isolated, creepy estate. It's fucking terrifying. Plus, the reveal at the end. Damn good. So, Mm. he likes it. We like it. The legacy. Let's get into this, Gav. So, uh, you hadn't seen this before. No, did you do the thing? Or did I just completely tune out then? Did you do the synopsis? Oh, I did the synopsis, yes. Yeah. I completely must have tuned out. No, I hadn't seen this before, and I was really gutted, because I totally forgot about it. This was filmed, uh, t- like, ten minutes from me. Um, I know I've said that a million times before. I don't know why it is around here, but the, uh, the uh, estate and stuff was. And you're right, Kev, all those roads are like that as well. Uh, around this around this neck of the woods, so to speak. Um, I forgot to go check out the house, actually, Norman. I didn't know this movie. I feel like I should have known this movie, and I feel like I should have seen this movie back in the day, late night, as a kid on TV. And I hadn't, and I didn't. found it on YouTube um, to watch, and, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's kind of what you expect, and it's quite nice having... I kind of like... Always like the movies, the older movies, but back in the day where you have, like, an American over in somewhere like England or something like that. Just one of them. And it's just it gives it a little bit more of a style to it or something. Do you, do you know what I mean? As be- yeah. Before we had the internet, when it was an aeroplane ride to America or wherever. But it kind like, of gave um, it pedigree almost or something. The Omen or American yeah. Werewolf in London, those kind of movies. Yeah, it's totally. always cool to yeah. see. Hmm. And I like it that they don't necessarily always explain you know, sometimes it's just there is a foreign person in the, in a foreign land, and that's what adds to the weirdness of it. You know, it's cool. Yeah, um, this movie was directed by Richard Marquand. We should mention Richard Marquand directed my favourite Star Wars film, Return of the Jedi, in 1983. Connection, uh, the film that we're making, set mm-hmm. after Return of the Jedi, and I'm directing that. <laughs> fancy, <Hello>. fancy. <laughs> uh, it's it stars Catherine Ross, beautiful Catherine Ross. It stars the beautiful Sam Elliott. Uh, Sam Elliott's is, beautiful moustache. He is like the man's man, isn't he? And everything he's in, he's he just is. like... He's, he, a, he's the sort of man, he's going to whip his chest out at any moment, isn't he? Yeah. It's going to be f- f- hairy. It is hairy. Manly. And it gets better with age, I think. Now he's grey, and he's got a grey moustache. He just looks like he should always really have been a grey... Well, in um, I mean, he just looks so incredible at the end of um, Big Lebowski, you know. Yes, there's a few other people in this movie, Super but the cool. only the other one I will mention that's in this movie is random. You've heard of the band The Who? You've heard of Roger Daltrey? Yes, Roger Daltrey does turn up as Clive in this movie, and the reason he's in this movie, he was. Let me guess, he was boning someone who was involved with it. No, it's his house. Oh, and he oh, said, oh, right, you are. Okay. I'll, let, I'll let you shoot here if, if I can be in it. And they said, all right, we'll actually write a character for you, which kind of works. They kind of squeeze. And he has, in my opinion, and we'll get to it properly in a minute, the most shocking death out of any of them in it. And he does an incredible job of acting as he dies. But we'll talk about that as we get to the death. That's so funny. So, yeah... Yeah, so he must have lived locally, yeah. <clears throat> Who's the other guy? Who's the jam uh, lead singer? Uh, uh, Weir, isn't it? Not sure. Oh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he lived locally as well. I think they all sort of live around here. Yeah, Ravenhurst. It's called Roger Daltrey's Real Life Residence. He lent them his mansion in the movie on the condition that he could co-star in it, and the producers agreed, and they created the role of Clive, especially for him. Oh, saying that, though, I think the interior and exterior is shot in different places. I would say that the interior is shot in different places. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Um, this movie starts off, everything's green. Why is everything fucking green? I don't know. Because uh, they love their plants. But like, everything's green. Uh, it's like, like, uh, like the furn- furnishings are green, everything's green. Uh, maybe it's just to emphasise that they're green-fingered? I don't know. I think so. But so let's let's kick into gear then. So we start with meeting Margaret or Maggie, our main uh, final girl or main lead, if you want. Uh, she's on the phone and she's organising a check, a check for fifty thousand dollars, which that she's waiting to be cleared. Now she is a British lady, mm. and she has an American fella played by Sam Elliott, and he plays Pete, her all-American, oh, hairy-chested, mustachioed man of all men i'm a stash pete uh, and pete and maggie they run a business together in the u.s where they are they look after um 
plants and they gardens. They paint, paint things green. They paint everything green. <laughs> They've got a job painting Luther Ringo's butt in the Incredible Hulk series. You do that, Chick. <laughs> I'll do this one. Imagine Sam, now I'm picturing Sam Elliott just painting gently with Ringo's butt cheek. <laughs> like what, the fucking karate kid? <laughs> Doing that wax up, wax up, don't you say. And Lou Ringo's going, it tickles, careful. <laughs> Sam, I've told you before. <laughs> don't tickle my bum. Stop it. It's like you um, a carry on movie or something. I, I apologise, Kevin. We're already into some crazy territory here, and we've barely started. But Incredible Hulk's bum being painted by Sam Elliott. <laughs> well, they anyway. They are he green wore shorts. He never had his bum out. The cheeks know, never, never got painted. They don't need look, to. Here's a, an Easter egg for you. Mm-hmm. Look at look at his feet. He was never actually barefoot. He was actually wearing sandals that were the same colour as the paint, the green paint, Love so it. that he could run around in the streets. Oh well, yeah. And didn't hurt his feet. Oh, yeah, I, I, I understand that. You know? Hmm? Bare, barefoot was not a thing for the Incredible Hole. Anyway, back to the legacy. So this couple, they uh, have just secured a job in the, in, the, in Britain, in the England, to go and uh, restore some stuff in a mansion and do some plants and some sort of uh, gameskeeping, I guess. Uh, groundskeeping, I guess that's what they call it. Paint your things green, I think. Painting the things green. Um, he says, like, what is the job? She's like, I don't really know, but they've given us $50,000, so let's just go. And he's like, I don't really want to go with you. Do I, what, so do we, we, we don't actually know what a job is. We're just packing up and we're going to England because they're giving you loads of money. Oh, this is sketchy as hell. Yep. It's, come on. But this is pre-internet. Um, so what does that mean? Guys, so the, it just means that these guys are like quite trusting. You know How's I mean? that trusting? <laughs> I don't know. Look, if I went to, Eng- to England with Sam Elliott, I wouldn't be worried about anything because he, especially because he's got a motorbike and he's he's going to protect me, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But they meet a guy called Jason Mount Olive. They do. Well, let well let's take to, get oh, to that then. Oh. So. So they're in England, all of a sudden, they land, the plane lands, and we get some lovely views of the British sites now, um, you know, the countryside, we see them exploring London, looking around, uh, all the people in London, and then he gets his motorcycle and they they go bombing down the road, and it's all very romantic, you know, she's holding on to him from behind, like, oh, I love you, Pete, and he's like, mm, I'm a man. <laughs> I missed that scene, was it deleted? Yeah, it was on my special copy in my head. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, they swerve off the road mm. into some, into the woods. Now, they're both okay, but they swerved around a quite a fancy sort of chauffeur-driven car. And the driver and, and the man inside the car get out and come over in to check on them. And because he's British, the man inside the car says... Well, look, you both seem like you're okay. Leave your motorcycle here, and why don't you both come back to mine for a cup of tea? So, let me get this straight. They're not the people she goes over to England for the job with. They are. They are. But she happens to be like, oh, isn't that funny that you met me here? Well, she doesn't know it's them yet. Well, okay. That's right. Okay, yes, but they they do say, you know, we're fixing your motorbike, come back to the house. That old says- chestnut what, you want me to just leave my bike here? And he's like, this isn't New York, old boy. This is England. Don't worry about it. You know, um, Akash? <clears throat> I do. He was um, canoeing by himself down at lake, and he looked over, and there's a group of people, and they help, help us! And he goes over, and he, he strung them up and canoed them back, and it took him back to their place. It was a big fucking mansion. They took him in for the, the afternoon, gave him lunch and stuff, and then sent him on his way. <laughs> Like the hero he was. That could have been a horror story, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, get out. But it wasn't. It was like, yeah. have have lunch. Thanks for saving us. So, uh, Sam Elliott and Catherine, well, Catherine Ross, Margaret, Maggie, get taken back to, quite frankly, the biggest fucking house I've ever seen. Um, but on the way there, they go through a little village and they get some strange looks from the mechanic. We're not sure what that's about. He sort of looks at uh, Sam Elliott. Maybe he's thinking, now that is the manliest man I've ever seen. Uh, probably. <laughs> I love the little villages and, uh, and uh, I love the fact that still, like even today, I was driving through little fertility villages that look exactly like that still because they're still in England in perfect shape. They're, they're yeah. everywhere. They're literally everywhere. Weirdest little roads where you can't get fucking any cars through. 
the the chauffeur pops out of the car and goes over to the the garage and says to the mechanic got a motorcycle that needs picking up and repairing he's like oh i'll take care of it yeah, no worries so everybody knows everybody in this little village and they certainly know the man who's being chauffeured around in this very expensive car mm. so yes yeah, so we get to the huge house the huge grounds and he says to his guests just go on in um i'll be in in a moment so they sort of get out. Now, I noticed that they haven't really... For a couple that have moved to England, they've basically got one little bag with them. Not, they haven't got a lot of there, have they? Maybe it was coming later. Maybe, yeah. So, yeah, so they met, meet this guy called Jason Mount Olive. And um, mm. so I did a bad dad joke, and I looked at Sarah. You wouldn't say it in front of your children, so it's not really a dad joke. I looked at Sarah, and I said, Gavin Mount Sarah. Brilliant. She just looked at me so you're asking, did Jason Mount Olive? Ja well, Jason Mount Olive, you know, did Jason Mount Olive. But a strange mm. name, I thought, for choice of your character, Jason Mount Olive. But this maybe popular at the time? There's probably a, a, a meaning behind it or something. Maybe. Well, when they get out of the car, they uh, leave him in, in the back of the car and he takes a pill. Then I've put after, because when, when she gets in the car, I've put the Jason Mount Olive next one, but Jason wants to mount uh, Margaret. The way he looks at Margaret. He does. Surely Sammy looks like, oh, but obviously we know, or listeners, you don't know yet, unless you've watched the movie, which we hope you have anyway, but you don't know that if we're going to get to the slight twist, but obviously this guy's a bit sketchy, but he must be looking at her because he knows what's going on. Obviously yeah. he does, you know. She, she's a, she's <coughs> chosen for a reason, isn't she? The chosen one. So they go into the house, Mar Margaret and Pete, and uh, he takes a pill, like I say, in the car, so we get a little indication that his health, this Mount, Mount Olive guy's health, might not be the best, because he's taking some kind of pill. As they go in the house, we see a cat. It is. When they're just left in the house, it's a matter of, oh, you go in the house and leave you. It's a little bit like a lamb's going to slaughter. You're like, are they about to be sabotaged when they get in the house or something? What's going to happen? Do you know what I mean? Well, they explore the house a little bit. They find the cat with different coloured David Bowie eyes. Um, David Bowie, I'm hello. a cat, I'm yeah. a cat with different coloured eyes. You provide me of the mouse, what mouse? The mouse I'm going to eat, meow. Uh, that's David Bowie cat. <laughs> okay. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Heavy Breaver walks up the stairs, don't know what the yeah. note that is. is it's, it? the nur it's the nurse, we're going to see more of her in a bit. <laughs> then they find a gigantic swimming pool. This swimming pool is pretty huge, isn't it? That, that epic sort of Roman-looking type one. It's almost like they've gone back in time. Mm. It is gigantic. Um, so but it's this, beautiful. So this is what Roger Dolce swam in and got his exercise. That's right. Weird. So I don't think it was inside that real mansion, though. I think that was a different in interior. That, to the exterior. I doubt if he had a swimming pool. I mean, <coughs> he might have done. The Who were a pretty big band. He might have done. Uh, what? The swimming pool is a different, another interior, but somewhere else. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I, reckon, I wouldn't be surprised if that was it. Well, our host, Mount Olive, uh, he um, struggles out of the car and up the stairs, and he's not very well. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we meet Heavy Breather. That is Nurse Adams. <laughs> Uh, and she is, uh, yeah, when she's spying on them to let, let us know that she's there, she does a bit of the old... <laughs> but it also might be Mount Olive uh, that's for some of these scenes later on. <laughs> Stop. Uh, I'm going to have to call him something else if you're going to laugh every time I say Mount Olive. <laughs> so, Nurse Adams tells them a little bit about the village. She says, oh, don't worry about the village, they're all a bit strange here. But come on up to your room, and it's almost like she's been expecting them she shows them up to her room and she says there's a separate room each and they say well actually we're going to stay in the same room if that's all right with you she's like yep whatever you want the fire's already lit in this room there's the bed uh and then dinner's going to be later on and she walks off and they say that's a bit weird isn't it maggie says it's almost like she knew we were coming and he said well it's winter they probably got the fires lit in every room massive, massive fireplaces not just for the bedrooms he says, don't worry about it. He says, I'll tell you what, let's have sex, OK? I did think that was quite funny. It was the middle of the afternoon. I've just literally gone to this place, and they're like, oh, just chill out here. What? I don't know, like, you know, I don't think I'd be, that would be my first... It wouldn't be so far off, but it wouldn't, wouldn't be my first thought. It's what the song Afternoon Delights was written for. 
I, 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 I'm all up for sex of any hour of the day, to be honest with you. All hours a day, 24 hours a day. But Jesus. All the time. But, um... All right. <laughs> but, I don't know, I, it seems a really weird thing to do. Would you think this was just so that we could have a sex scene in the film? I think... Because yeah, of well, that time... I mean, maybe, but I think they've just got... been through a traumatic car crash, a bike crash. Mm. They're happy to be somewhere safe and warm. They're a very attractive couple. They're into each other. I, Here's I, a giant four-poster bed. Let's bang. I would say it is, it is, because Sam Elliott at that time then would also have been like, oh, he's he's eye candy for the ladies and men or whatever. <clears throat> but um, I think they definitely would have done that, because you've got to think then there's no videos, VCRs and shit. Um, you watch, you catch this movie the once at cinema, and people weren't at home watching smart and porn because they might have had their own projectors and porn reels. Very doubtful. It wasn't fucking nowadays Pornhub on your phone or anything, you know. So like, I think they probably put sex scenes into movies a bit more back in the day then to give people that stuff because they just didn't get it anywhere else. Well, you didn't see a lot. It wasn't like the sex you, scene. You get to cinema, night. but not pe many people could do that. It's probably quite seedy. Then it felt, or it, it, it might have seemed. Yeah, I mean, it's more implied, really. Cause mm. it's, it's not. It's not like, like I say, it's not like the scene in Don't Look Now, where you get to see Donald um, Sutherland sucking someone's toes and doing sixty nines and whatever else they were doing in that film. This is just a very subtle Im implication of sex, which unfortunately is cut quite short. Because after they're cuddling afterwards, we go from Sam Elliott's big chopper to a big chopper landing on the lawn outside, don't we? Segway. A huge helicopter lands on the lawn outside. One chopper to another. And once you get to the chopper, I watched that again the other night. So good. And uh, very important-looking, rich-looking people step <laughs> out. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Arnold does not get out of this chopper. Very important, rich-looking people step out of this uh, helicopter, and they discuss: uh, Are our friends the Americans here? Oh, who? Yes, they are. Okay, fantastic. And then they look up and they see. Um. They see Sam Elliott, and she says, who's he? And somebody says, oh, he's an unexpected guest. And, yeah, oh, yeah, totally, yeah. At this point in here, though, we didn't need it, but going back to what I just said, we see we see Elliot, uh, I was about to say Elliot Ness, Sam Elliott's bum. And what a chiselled piece of art it is. It is going back to what I was just saying, though, just saying. We didn't need to see his bottom. It wasn't needed. But they obviously put it in for well, the, glad it was. the ladies or fancy men. Um, just, just like Mel Gibson's butt in the beginning of Lethal Weapon. It wasn't needed, but I'm so glad it's in there. Yeah, I suppose that is true. And um, uh, <laughs> he finds out English plumbing's a bit hot. Oh, hello. Is that a segue? Oh, no. I thought you were talking about... Um something else then yes he gets in the shower and he's having a lovely shower after sex shower but all of a sudden yes the it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and he cannot turn off the knob his knob won't work gab he, he's cleaning himself not like donald sutherland not donald sutherland donald pleasance hang on a minute careful <laughs> too many donald's in the shower here. <laughs> donald duck's in the shower so yes, he um, he himself. ends up having to smash the shower door to get out of the shower because he's getting scolded. Yeah, and then he then he realizes it's, it does suddenly it works again. It's almost like something supernatural. And basically, it, basically right? they're like, "Right, you guys come in here. Sorry, your bike's broken. Take this room." They go and put love juice everywhere, and then they <laughs> then they go and smash the shower screen, smash the bathroom up. What are you guys doing, you fucking maniacs? Yeah, because he says to her, um, can you, she says, I'll go and get some help. So she sort of walks downstairs and walks into the middle of a big sort of staff meeting, all the sort of cleaners and cooks. And Old she, school is where you get like, you get like the uh, lower kitchen or just the kitchen in general, which happens to be also the staff quarters mm. where they, they all sit around and you know, and we have one of the lead of the house giving orders and saying what's going on. And the nurse happens to be doing it. So I presume she does this quite a bit. So I presume she is head of the house. And I'm um, giving giving just a little talk talking to them, isn't she? Which yeah, she sort of in a minute. Well, she sort of plans that each day with them, I think. But also, yeah, the, yeah. we should also mention there's fucking cats everywhere in this mansion as well, which is always a bit unnerving. But um, she walks in, uh, Maggie, into the middle of this meeting. She says, "I'm sorry to interrupt you all. Um, there's been a bit of a." a 
problem in our room. Um, basically, oh, fuck the, the shower fuck, is fuck completely the shower. smashed to pieces. <laughs> and we're also going to need some antiseptic because there's cuts all over my boyfriend's back. Come on, what uh, have you guys been doing? You're just um, like, and there's in a water room. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> the nurse is like, don't worry about it. You take that up. Uh, you deal with your boyfriend and I'll send up somebody in a moment to clean up the glass. Oh, yeah, nun, gi- nun gives cream. That's what my note is. I was wondering <laughs> what that note was. The nun gives the cream. Um, the old antiseptic. And then as they, as she walks out of the room, they carry on discussing something. And she, somebody says, Mr. Mount Olive is fading fast. <laughs> Ooh. Yes, he's starting to pass. Uh, well, well, he he's getting ill. So he, she's telling all the uh, other members of the uh, the staff this. Mm. So there is there is they another must, plot. Going yeah, on. do you think they're all in? They must all they're all obviously all in. So they're just like knowing that. Is they must be like just really good actors because they all know that she's going to take place. Yeah, and yeah. then she comes in, but they're all just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm okay, ignoring her, even though they're like that's actually. Don't look, don't look. So you, you, you should know? have you should have watched this film if you haven't done. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. But, um, there is definitely a bit of a, a Rosemary's Baby vibe, and I suspect that Kevin, you are probably a big fan of. Um, and let us know, please do let me know. I suspect you are probably a fan of Rosemary's Baby as well, because there are some elements of this that really remind me of that as well. Mm. Um, so while this is all happening, Pete decides now he's all patched up and dry. He's going to call the garage. About his motorcycle, so he, he calls them, and they're like, "Yeah, don't worry. There's a few parts missing, but we'll, we'll have it all fixed for you. It's all fine. Don't worry about that." He um, wants to rent a car, but they, they, you know, there isn't a car for him to rent. He starts yeah. to be, be a bit suspicious, which I would be as well. But this is old school England, English village, you know. Um, it's yeah, a bit uh, shut off in the seventies. Yeah, there's not yeah, going to be like a, a rent a car place for a hundred miles. Christ, no. London prob- will probably be your nearest place if there is one in the seventies, even. You know, mm. um, Maggie has a little catch up with Nurse Adams, who kind of is, again heavy breathing, stalks her a little bit initially, and then, <laughs> and then finally he starts talking to her, and she says, "Oh, um, she, she talks about." <clears throat> Jason Mount Olive. She says, "Yes, he was a wonderful man." And Maggie says, well, no, "Sorry, past tense. That's yeah. tense, sir. Yeah. But um, somebody else is watching them from the shadows, and I believe that is probably Mount Olive. I keep oh. wanting to say Mount Batten. I don't know what Mount Batten is, but uh, it's not. It's not that. It's Mount Olive. But yeah, somebody else is watching her from the shadows. So Pete goes off and starts hanging out with the other guests that arrived in the helicopter. He's, he, you know, he's a likable, charming guy, and they all start sort of chatting to him. If Sam Elliott walked in the room and you have a little drinky, he'd be like, fucking hell, oh, mate, how's, how's it going? What are you up here? What are you doing here? Yeah. I'd be like, oh, you're American. Tell me, what's going on? What are you doing yeah, here? Yeah, oh. I reckon he'd be quite a lot of love for the party. Yeah, he's probably got a few anecdotes. Yeah. You know, he's probably shot, shot a few deer, you know... He's got a few stories. If you're lucky, you might get, up, get into a little punch-up with him. Even He'd even say to you, you know, well, actually, actually, on the way here, I even on the way here, I got into a motorcycle crash. That's what I'm doing here. It's, even his journey there is a little bit of an adventure, you know what I mean? Mm. What did you do when you got here, then? Did you sort of rest? Well, no, I fucked my girlfriend in the bedroom upstairs. Jesus Christ, you are just rock and roll, aren't you? I well, a shower, and it got really hard, and I smashed the screen <laughs> with my ass. <laughs> just... <laughs> didn't do that with his ass, I pushed my, tense my butt cheeks are real I mean, tight. His butt, his butt was pretty muscly, but I don't know if he smashed the glass with his ass. Squeezed him tight, I did. Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, um, well, he's hanging out with the other guests. They're all sort of Pop, popped chatting. Popped open, it smashed the glass. This scene, we've seen this scene done in millions of ways. It, we saw it done in a film we reviewed recently called... Um, uh, what was the Carry On movie that we covered? Um, my choice, my birthday issue with Sid James. Uh, what a carve-up. What a carve-up, yes. Uh, we've seen this film, this scene done in every film where a bunch of people go to a, a, a haunted house or a mansion to either have a will read to them or to go there for a reason they don't know why or it's a family gathering. And, you know, we've got this happening here. Sam Elliott is just getting to know all these random people that seem to all know each other. House in Nightmare Park. Yep. Thank House in Haunted Hill. All of these movies. Mm. And, and then Maggie walks in 
And she's immediately accosted by Clive, the cool Roger Daltrey, man in the music business. Hi, I'm Roger Daltrey. I'm definitely not on loads of cocaine. Look at me. My hair's wonderful. I've and he got kind a of, whole room upstairs full of coke. <laughs> I got the suitcase from True Romance upstairs. Come on. Yeah. Um, probably would. And he flirts with Maggie in front of Sam Elliott. <clears throat> Doesn't give a so. shit, does he? He's just like, whatever. Uh, so they all kind of meet and seem to... They all seem to know about Maggie. So you must be... Oh, yeah, so you must be the American, yeah. And Sam and Maggie... Good, exchanging glances across this room because she'd said earlier i feel like they're all expecting me and he's like you must be off you know insane this is but he's starting to see there is something weird going on here and it's almost like they were expecting her well but what is this all about so he decides to go for a walk i do love the fact we got the devil rides out guy in this yes he's in it as well isn't he's he? so good he's just so like scary he was a i'm sure he was a villain in uh, one of the sean connery bonds as well charles gray um <clears throat> his name is mm. uh, yeah he's good in this um so uh, sam elliott even going for a little wander around the uh um mansion on his own has an adventure because he comes across a beautiful lady <laughs> sam elliott and his adventures <laughs> And he just sort of wanders in with a beer in his hand, and he's like, oh, there's a hot woman swimming in the swimming pool. I'll just watch her oh, for a bit. I, I said to Sarah about this, because I, it's how I, then Sam Elliott's, because they clock each other, then that, so he just leans over, and have a little conversation a little bit. She says, are you going to join me? Yeah. And he's like, no, I don't think I will, actually. I'm just going to watch you, pretty lady. You keep on swimming over there. I'm actually shocked she wasn't naked. I was pretty surprised she'd... Shocked or disappointed? <laughs> Whatever one you'd like to think from me. And, and then, so she he's leaning over the balcony, this woman just swimming, watching her. Then his missus, his, well, his girlfriend, she turns up and she's there as well. And she just starts staring as well. And then, then how do they get away from that? It not being sexual, it's like, it's good form. Oh, yeah, she's a good swimmer. And like... Fuck off, are you thinking that, Sam Elliott, with that little moustache? You're licking that moustache with your tongue, and you're not thinking how good she fucking does the backstroke. Well, I think she says something like, you've seen anything you like? And he says... It's uh, not the swimming technique, is it? And then, and then um, he says, well, I think I've seen enough. Oh, come on, I'll buy you a beer. And he gives her a really big snog like a big gold kiss and sort of drags his hand across her tummy his girlfriend's tummy it's almost he is uh, it's he's almost like, like i've just got her a boner from looking at her let's go fuck yeah, <laughs> oh, thank you. that makes me feel really special he's like a tiger in this isn't he he's just <laughs> walking around the, the mansion uh, like. knocking things <laughs> over and breaking stuff with his ass <laughs> Oh, his ass is wonderful. But I said to Sarah, I said, what would you do if I'm over his balcony just leaning, just watching this girl swim, and you came up, and I don't even clock you coming up, I just know oh, you're no. there, and just we carry on looking, and you look as well. Would you be cool with that? And she'd be like, I would be wondering what you're doing. <laughs> so, what, yeah, yeah. What, do you think, what do you think my wife would say if oh my we, were God. At, we were at a party, Oh my God! I and, think... I, and I wandered off and started watching a woman swimming okay, with it, a beer in my hand? If hands. Alice did that, she would bottle you, probably. <laughs> She would then throw a bottle, somehow hit striking the woman, drowning her, is what I think would probably happen. I think Sarah would be like, what the fuck are you doing, possibly? But I don't think she'd go as much as bottling me. I think Alice would probably bottle you and say, she would, you deserved it, Dan. If there say. was a harpoon gun somewhere in that mansion, Alice would have it in her hand. <laughs> if a girl walks past you in, in the town of Bristol, like over on the, another road... She, and smiles she, at me. She always, even just smiles. She's, Alice is probably knifing her. Yeah. She does sometimes get a bit protective of me, doesn't she? She does. I've noticed. <laughs> I don't know why, because I'm not the most attractive man in the world. She thinks everybody no. wants to get with me, but nobody really does. Well, I don't understand, because she, you're a nice fella, and you're not going to go and do that. So I don't understand what the thing is. I think it's to show you that she still like, like she, I like you that much, I'll fight with you. Even though you can say to her, you don't need to, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not I mean, running I'm... away with her. You know. <laughs> anyway, this is a conversation to have off, off air. Yeah, hopefully Alice won't listen to this episode. <laughs> Alice uh, doesn't anyway, listen. Uh, so they, does, they Alice, leave. does Alice ever listen? She listens, yeah. Not she? Now and again. Okay, now I know again. Sarah listens every time. Um, 
So they leave the swimming lady, whose name I believe is Maria, to her swimming, uh, and they wander back towards the sort of the party area, and um, they get back there and uh, they're introduced. Uh, Clive sort of says, "You know, I, I I'm in the music industry," um, and somebody says, "You are the music industry in Europe," and they're all in their fields. They're all extremely it's- successful people in whatever it is they do in life. I wasn't sure what he does if he's a producer or management and A and R or something. I, I yeah. thought maybe he's management, or, or do you know what I mean? Or he just handles talent because if he he, he is the music, isn't really. He can't just be the only music anyone listens to in Europe. So I'm assuming that he gets the axe, is what I'm guessing. Yeah, he's going to be like your Simon Cowell of the 70s. That's what I'm assuming it is. Um, It doesn't really go into that, but you don't really need to. Uh, And and each of these individuals in this room, so there's six of them, um, they're all incredibly successful and multi-millionaires or billionaires and whatever it is they do, and they all introduce themselves. It's a bit weird. It's a bit fucking... I didn't know if it was. It didn't come across too egotistical, but they all start saying it of all their achievements. But it's not really for ego, like I just said. It's it ends up being sort of almost a reason she's given them, letting her know all of what they do and where they've come from and how. I don't know why. Is is it conditioning well, her they, to? Well, no. Sort of, it's because um, it's t- it's it's letting her know, but it's also telling us as the audience that. But we they, need- the, re- the reason they are as successful as they are is because they've all made a pact and they're all in this... this uh... oh, well, of course, that is the reason. It's almost like a deal with the devil. Yeah, well, it is literally the deal with the devil. You know, he's upstairs passing away and uh, his power has been given to them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. He shares, he shared a, a, he's shared an, a percentage of his power with each of them. That's right. And that's but, why they're showing, all, giving out all their achievements. Because I was listening, watching it, going, you know, they're not coming across like, oh, oh, well, I'm so successful. It's not like that. Yeah, it's really they're just sort of saying to her, basically, you know, you're you're going to be really successful in whatever it is you do, just like we are. If you take the power, but they haven't said any of that yet. They're just building up to is it, it building up to it. Essentially, wearing that ring, I suppose. Yeah. Um. So, that's all cool. They're all very successful. All of a sudden, Maria. <laughs> the, swim, the, swim, the swim woman turns into an underwater mime. <laughs> yeah, and this is the scene that Kevin said scared him uh, as a kid. And I can imagine, it's a bit of a phobia. Imagine <laughs> Kev's doing a brilliant mime. <laughs> it's almost a bit like the dudes in the box in, at the end of uh, uh, Superman. It is. It is. Well, the, That's basically, her in the swimming to, pool, essentially. so to paint the picture, like there's, it's almost like someone's put a glass lid on the swimming pool. Yeah. Um, and she, because she's just swimming away, and all of a sudden she can't, she can't get out of the swimming pool. How fucking scary is that? It is something I've thought. Of. I don't. I'm not a very good swimmer, as you know. In fact, I barely swim at all. And that is something I sometimes think about. Like that. That scene in Lethal Weapon Two really scares me when they fall in the swimming pool with the cover on it. Yeah. Because I imagine, like, what would happen if that... I'd probably die in that, you or, know? Or, like, under ice. Oh, don't... Yeah, under ice. That's one of the worst ones, I think. Mm. Apparently drowning is, like, really painful. Oh, yeah, because your lungs sort of burst, don't they? And it could be the pain in your head as well. Oh, God. Think, well, think, she... think, when you get, think when you get, like, frozen head, you know, frozen head. <laughs> You know, when you're eating <laughs> Fuck it, Al. Fro- think when you get <laughs> What's it called? frozen head. Do you mean ice cream headache? Yeah, 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 yeah. Frozen head. Fuck it, Al. When that happens, and that's painful to say, imagine... <gasps> What's wrong, Gov? Got oh, frozen head. <laughs> imagine when, you know, it's just water's going into, into your lungs and your brain like that. The pain must be... Oh, it's cruciating. I can imagine. Mm. Well, Maria, it looks like she is drowning... Um, they can't see, obviously, an invisible lid on the pool. She sinks to the bottom of the pool. Sam Elliott, of course. Of course he does. Of course he does. Come on, guys. Everybody, to what's he going to do? Straight to the rescue. I'm popping Pulls out these bum cheeks and I'm getting in that water. He jumps in. He drags her, her body out. Uh, but she's dead. She is dead. Even Sam Elliott's buttocks could not save her. Nope. And they've saved many people. Yes, um, these, bu- these buttocks have saved many a person. And somebody says, well, it looks like we now we are the six. And uh, Maggie's like, what does that mean? We are the six. And obviously that means they're making way for a new member of the six because Maria's been killed. 
So that means Maggie is now one of the circle, one of the six in the circle. I was thinking this movie, <clears throat> like you have Richard Donner with The Omen, if you had, I think, a more major director... You said this director did... What did he do? You like Return of the Jedi. But he's quite big, though, isn't it? It's very big, isn't it? Yeah. What else did he do? Uh, he did some writing. I don't actually know... I, I was just that. wondering, because this movie, I feel like, directed, you know, maybe slightly differently or something, or something a bit more pedigree, but that's pretty good if you direct to Return Jedi. Um, do you know what I mean? I don't know if this movie would have been more successful. Uh, what else did he do? He also directed... Where, like, Polanski did Roman's ba Rosemary's Baby. You know, do you know what I mean? Having that sort of a... Uh, person that doesn't really step into the horror genre and then go and do something like that. He directed a couple of films, but nothing major. The only two, the two biggest films he did was, was Re this. Return and, and, oh, really? Yeah. I think maybe if this had been handled by someone else, I think it might, it could have been even a little bit more successful. I wonder how they picked him for Return of the Jedi, because I know that... No, it could be, Luke, any, Luke, it could be all sorts. Lucas didn't want to direct this last, the second two, so he just brought in people that he knew that were good in the industry, but I don't know. We're going off on a Star Wars tangent there, but hey, that's what we do. We do tangents. So, Pete's tried to save her. She's done. Maria's dead. And uh, Nurse says, well, there seems to have been an accident. Yeah, fucking damn right. We got a dead lady in the swimming pool. Next is uh, Sam Elliott with the largest stride a man has ever had sitting on a sofa. Yeah, so this is called uh, man spreading. Um, <laughs> wow, I, I've heard that name and now I know what it is. Did you see yeah, the picture so I put of it up with the comment I Sarah did. said? She went, "That is a widespread." Because man spreading is a thing that men apparently, and I've seen it done done on buses and trains, where men will sit with their legs very wide apart, almost aggressively, <laughs> taking up a lot of space. Yeah. You, now, if you don't have testicles. Oh my god, here we go, fuck it now. If you don't have testicles, you may not appreciate it enough, but you, but I will let any, you know... Any, sorry, hang on, any sentence from Gav that starts with... No, if you don't have testicles... But if, if you know, I will say, if you don't have testicles as well, we don't actually have to stride it that much. We don't have to do this massive wide spread. But I do got to say, having the old testes... You do have to have a little bit of a spread there because it's fucking painful having your legs. You just can't have your legs together unless you're tucking it. Unless you're silence the lamb in it. And you can't silence the lamb in it if you're sitting down. Why? Because it's all this meat episode, and veg. Smashed. This episode's just got everything, hasn't it? Meat and veg all just mashed into the chair underneath you. And nobody wants that and it's painful. Well, he sat there with his big old man spread anyway. And, um, Not having all, mashed Frank and beans. And they're all sort of debating what's happened. Um, when suddenly Maggie is called up to go and see Mr. Mount Olive. So her and her and Sam stand up and they say, actually, Sam Elliott, you don't need to come upstairs. He only wants to see Maggie. Sketchy. My, Sam and it's like, God damn it, I'll stay down here then, but I'm not happy about I'm it. I'm clenching my buttocks in anger. So he stays there. She goes upstairs, and all the guests are upstairs in a room. A room full of medical equipment and medical curtains and beep, beep, and all these machines. And what is this? What is going on here? It's all white. It's very strange. It looks like something out of a Frankenstein movie. It's all got Could American Ralph in Paris. Yeah, it's got a bit of that going on. It's all a bit strange. And a weird robotic voice suddenly comes out of the speakers. It's a creepy voice, too. Welcome to you all. It's really creepy. It says, well, welcome to you all. And it's coming from behind the curtain. And basically, this is the voice we find out of Jason Mount Olive. And he starts talking about, I would like to welcome you all. Um, and I, I'm really excited to pass on my legacy to you all. Uh, you all have the rings, um, and I'm going to give you my power uh, to all of you, and you're all going to become extremely powerful. You will become the six. And they're all sort of like, they're all nodding along, the rest of them like, yep, yeah, this is great, this is what we've been waiting for, you know, we're all, this is why we've come here in our big expensive helicopter. Whereas obviously Maggie is just sat there thinking, what the fuck is going on? Did, did you lace my tea with mushrooms this morning? <laughs> <laughs> 
five minutes ago I was pulling glass out of Sam Elliott's ass and now I'm sat in this room. I don't know what's going on. He then says, Margaret, he's not Donald Pleasant. (laughs) 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 He then says, Margaret, will you come in to the room, please? So she does. She comes over. She calls through the curtains. And he says, come over and be blessed. And she doesn't question it. She sort of goes, she's starting to think, well, I guess this is what my destiny is then. I'm thinking, I've been called to this house. Fuck knows why. So let's, let's go. So she goes behind the curtains. And she sits in the chair near him. And suddenly this horrible clawed hand grabs her, doesn't it? Yep. And it, and it puts a ring on her finger. And uh, for a split, just for a split second, we see his face. It's an horrible old little wrinkly white face, isn't it? Yeah, it would be a little shocking. He's about 200 years old, he looks. She gets the fuck out of there and and presumably tells Sam, and Sam's obviously like, let's get the hell out of here. Well, she tells Sam, she says, they put this ring on, and I can't get this ring off, look. Let me try with my buttocks. (laughs) He (laughs) says... He says to her, look, you're just a little bit uh, tense. Your finger's swollen up. Put it's your finger fine. up my bum and I'll clench it real hard. <laughs> <laughs> right, you talk to me about Kevin Bacon and my obsession with his junk, but you have talk, been talking about seven minutes sculpted, and they are sculpted buttocks. Do you know what? So much. I've got a feeling his buttocks are coming out of my mouth again before this episode's up. <laughs> Interesting. Um, anyway, she can't get this ring off of her finger That's while they're talking. That's all the bits talking, of society, isn't it? While they're talking, shunting somebody in another scene just quickly dumps a body in the river. Just chucks it in there. Whose body is that then? Hmm. That must have been Maria, the woman who drowned. Just dump her in the river. Don't worry about it. So um, she's, she cries. She can't, Maggie can't get this ring off. Like I say, she starts crying. He just says, look, just relax. We'll get a car. I'll hire a car. We'll get the hell out of here. It's all good. I've got a plan. Look at this moustache. My plan is look at the moustache. Now turn around Reed. and use my buttocks to smash the doors open. <laughs> Read between my moustache. I will get us out of here. My buttocks can fly helicopters too. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So the other guests in another scene now are discussing the inheritance, this power that they are inheriting, this legacy. And so they start discussing, well, what happened with Maria then? Was she murdered, do you think? You know, because now there's still six of us, including this Margaret woman, but it's a bit strange, you know, I don't understand. Well, Maggie has a little nap and she gets woken up by a cat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So Pete decides, I'm going to go and try the phone and find out what's going on with this garage, with my bike. I'm going to see if I can get a car together. Phone lines are all busy. None of them work. I love that in a, I love that in a, a movie pre-internet where the phone lines don't work as well. Because you just know you're screwed. Oh, I'm pre-mobile phone. It's great. He says to Maggie, look, I can't get through to anyone, but don't worry, we're going to leave first thing in the morning. They're She's proper like, screwed when they do actually leave, when we get to it. They are so screwed, aren't they? It's a great little adventure, it, actually. It's so simple how they do it, but uh, just effective when they do it. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about that scene, actually. Got a few things to say. Um, so him and Maggie are planning to leave in the morning. Carl and Jacques are two of the guests. They're outside, Gav. Bit of foreshadowing here. They are using bows and arrows, aren't they? Just before that, the nurse has said, you've got to stay. The police want to talk to you. Um, stay here. And Sam's like, fuck that. We can just go to town and go to the actual police station and we'll do that. And she's like, oh, because she, she doesn't actually have any power over them staying. And she's like, oh, okay then. But yeah, yeah she, go outside and, yep. Yeah. He, he doesn't believe her that she's called the police. Yeah, she's he, like, he thinks, well, yeah. he thinks he's a bit suspect. So, um... Pete's talking to the chauffeur, the man who drives the cars, and... Uh, Devil rides out, f- fucking's having a little go of the... He just... They've got really good aim. They're, we've seen them a couple of times. It's like the sort of build-up, have a couple of times, then the third one, you know. And they're, they're just firing them, and they're, they're proper hitting the targets where they want to go. And then at one point, the crossbow, we see it from the cameras, kind of like the, the crossbow's POV is the camera, and it turns round... Looks at, looks at, looks at where he's standing and shoots at the door 
just missing his groin and his buttocks. And this was because the chauffeur was just about to give away a bit too much information because he's sort of saying, have you not heard that Mr. Mountbatten's, Mr. Mount Olive's really ill and he's probably, no, he hasn't got long left. Do, do, they, does, do they know that the chauffeur's doing that? Like, yeah, that's why, a, that's why they do it. I think they, how do, they, they do, do it. That? I suppose they've they got devil's power, haven't they? They've got devil's power, Gav. You know what it's like with devil's power. So, um, Pete decides, fuck okay, it, I'm going to steal a horse here. Well, basically, very quickly, the chauffeur's sort of saying that he, uh, uh, what's, going, what's going on, Jason? That's because he sounds kind of like he's made some sort of connection with the driver because he's the first person that he was in the car with. Probably chatted to him a little bit. And he says that he's, he's dying, sir. That's what's happening. And that's way too much information then, the arrow. But yes. He drives off and he leaves leaves Sam Elliott well, stranded. He goes back in to get get uh, is it uh, Catherine, Maggie. Uh, Maggie Margaret, yep, and um, she she fucking she uh, turned around and yeah the, the car drives off and he runs out. What the fuck? And that's when he walks past the devil rides out guy and he kind of looks at him and they just kind of give each other a bit of it. He's like I could right much aren't mood to sort of knock you out sort of things. How many yeah. him? Well, he goes into full-on cowboy mode now. He's like, right, here we go. I need a plan of action. So they go over to the the, the stables. They steal a horse. Steal a horse? Like, fuck it. Let's ride horses out of here. And th- I love this whole scene now. It's so exciting. Because I said this to Sarah. I said, what happened to me and you? Do? We both can't ride horses. It'd be fucking just dangerous. <laughs> Well, it's really exciting. You, you don't really see this, really. When people are trying to escape from a mansion in a film like this, it's not grab easy. Horses. It's yeah, quite but these guys, packed, isn't it? Yeah, they grab a horse, and we get this amazing 70s score a come a, in now. A bit of a scuffle happens, because the people come out to try and grab them, but, but Sam's there punching them left, right, and centre. He punches two or three guys, and then one of the guys lands on a fire and gets caught on fire. Which is pretty bad. Really random. And then they get away to really weird disco music. I don't think the role of music supervisor had been made in cinema at this point, which is legit true. And uh, I think that was um, uh, a a job that needed to be done by someone, not this person who chose the music. Well, we get this lovely shot of them riding off into the countryside now, and then they they arrive back at the village from earlier, and it's all very quiet in the village. It's gone all, like, COVID quiet. Yeah, it's like... um, it's like the village in um, Hot Fuzz or something. Is everyone's inside? There's no one out. It's all to, very quiet. To be fair, like I said, these villages around our way anyway, down in fucking England and the countryside, they're quite like that like, anyway. You could literally drive down one on a Sunday. It's fucking quiet as anything. You know, nothing going on. They all look like it now. The greater good. <sighs> and uh, he he finds his garage and he pops his head in to see what how his bike's getting on, Gav. And what state is his motorcycle in? <laughs> Fucked. It's in about a hundred pieces. It's fucked. They've not done anything to it. Nah, it's fucked. So he says, goes back out and he says, Well, my motorcycle's fucked, Maggie. Um, she's like, shh, shh, look, over there. It's the, the chauffeur. chauffeur's, it's the chauffeur's car. And he pulls up outside the little post office and he's <laughs> gone into the post office. A fucking uh, bit of Grand Theft Arson. Yeah, so they run over, jump in the chauffeur's car, steal it. Yep. I love this because he's like, right, let's do it. And he jumps in the car and she's like, oh, you, I thought you were going to drive. And he's like, oh, where's the steering wheel? She's like, we're in England. It's on the other side. And he's like, God damn it, you'll better drive then. So Maggie does the first part of the driving here. I remember I was driving in um, Menorca, I think it is, and that's uh, not the same as this, it's right hand drive. And just, just just getting the car rental place. They're just, just casually driving on the left lane. They all of a sudden go, why is that car coming towards? Oh, my God! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that slight panicking. Yes, it happens. Uh, it's a truck um, tries to take them out, but is this truck involved with them? Yeah, I think, I think basically... How do they all know? I think it's a web of evil that spreads into the village because the mechanic they and mu- they're all they're they all under the power of Mount Olive. know though. Well Mount Olive's got, you know, power, hasn't he, over everybody there, you know. Mm. And so as a chauffeur works for him, they all so, so yeah, they they almost crash. We have a bit of an adventure where Sam thinks they're on the wrong road. So then they go by the house. Oh shit, there's a the house again. Quick, keep on going. So they keep on going and all of a sudden they're back at the house again. Like, oh god, we've got to find the road out. Let's drive. Sam now drives like a fucking maniac well, on he these says, roads. He, he says, I think I better drive Maggie. She's like, Okay, cool. And he is like Steve oh McQueen in god. Bullet. Like I said, these roads around here, I drive them. You don't drive them like that because you are going in a ditch in seven. I've got to be honest, this is some of the best um, like dirt surprised. road driving I've seen in a, really, a movie. It wasn't the old, old fucking 
you know, sketchy effect by just speeding up the video footage or speeding up the footage. It was, it would have been probably a little bit, but it was really fast. I was quite surprised. Well, they end up, about three or four times, they end up back at the mansion. They just cannot get out of this loop. It's a bit like, let's just go in the house. And they just go back in the house. I know. Well, he, like, says, he says, what are you doing? She says, look, we're destined to get back to this house. So she just starts walking back in. And then just Barbara, the nurse, just, just comes down. No worries. Oh, I've brought you this dress if you want us for dinner tonight. Not even questioning where they've been. Yeah, you know, we stole horses. We stole the chauffeur's car. Yeah. Set a man on fire. <laughs> Fucking hell. She must, the nurse must have known. She like, knew the nurse he... must have treated the person who set on fire. Sam Elliott punched two guys out, <laughs> stole some horses, stole the limo, the set a man cares. on fire, and as well as all of that, an arrow got fired at the driver. And that's like three hours on a Saturday afternoon. And now he's come back for a cup of tea. <laughs> come back to smash another shower of you, Sam. Jesus Christ, we've just got your shower fixed. Don't be getting those buttocks near them. She walks in, Maggie walks into the kitchen, because they go in the tradesman's entrance. Um, and as she walks in, they're just cutting some chickens' heads off, aren't they? Yeah, that, always. I, I looked away. Always lovely to see. Um, yeah, no one cares they ran off. They, they discuss, you know, black magic at this point. Uh, Maggie says to some of the guests, you guys dealing with black magic then? Is that what this is? And he's like, <laughs> well, I guess you could call it that. Um, I mean, we don't, but uh, the occult, it's got many names, you know. So they kind of basically admitting to her that... I wonder if how this would have come out if it had been actually um, a Hammer-produced film. <clears throat> uh, well, it's close to feeling like a Hammer film, isn't it? Yeah, not totally there, though. Like the, the certain, you know, it's because the same producers, so they have the same people working it. That's where you get the style and the certain feel of it. It always stays the same. So it would be nice to have seen that as a Hammer movie, I think. It would have had to have probably been made a bit earlier. It would have been, like, maybe ten years earlier than this. Yeah, because Hammer at that point were fucking... Dodgy Jack, the movies. Yeah. And it probably would have been like Peter Cushing as the uh, as Mount Batten, Mount yeah. Olive in the, yeah, in the bed. Yeah, and you right. would have had like maybe Christopher Lee as... No, who would it have been as Sam um, Elliott's character? Yeah, but you I, would have needed an American guy, wouldn't but you? I, but I'm saying though, if it just been hand-produced but the same as it is, well, I'd like to have seen Sam Elliott still. I think that would have been great. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, <laughs> they probably would have put Vincent Price as, as the American in <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is not Vincent Price being action packed. No, no, no. <laughs> Vincent Price's buttocks. It's not something I want to see. But I agree with that one. So anyway, they discuss black magic. And they basically admit to her there is something strange happening, and they give her that address that you mentioned, Gab. And they talk about a ceremony, and there's going to be a ceremony of the six. Um, and they tell her that you know you were always going to be one of the six. Pete was an unexpected or an unwanted guest, but uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they, anyway, they have have some drinks, don't they? And um, they have some drinks. And, and old Roger Daltrey starts having a little bit of a cough. And it's like <laughs> well, well, they start um, having a, a massive feast, and they talk about the occult. They all talk about the occult while um, they're doing yes. that. It's not a drink, um, is it? Because uh, um, uh, yes, this is quite interesting. Roger Daltrey basically starts coughing a shitload because he's choking, isn't he? Yeah, so th there's a selection of meats, chicken and ham, etc. But and, uh, he doesn't have the chicken, does he? He doesn't. He says, no, no, just the ham for me. But he chokes on a chicken bone. So again, the occult. And, but you don't notice this at the time because of the fact that he's choking and it's quite a thing and he ends up sort of... He dies, doesn't he? Well, it's incredibly... Um, I've never seen a choking scene like this. I'm not just saying that, honestly. Like, he, the noise he makes when he's choking, really, sort of, he's so scared. And I didn't think Roger Daltrey would be a good actor, but he's really good at this, this bit where he dies. And they're trying to um, save him. And so in, in the end, they all put him on the table, and the nurse does the tracheotomy. And for anyone that doesn't know what that is, it's where you slice open someone's, um, uh, adult, like where your Adam's apple is, that where your windpipe is and you put something in to let the air out um but by the time she's done that he's died um they can't say she pulls the chicken bone out of his throat and yeah. i don't i don't mean out of his mouth i mean out of the hole in his throat yeah uh, and I'll, on a side note i knew somebody that had a tracheotomy at school really um yeah one of the guys one of the kids at my school michael his name is um he 
came back from school holidays with a big scar uh, sort of where his Adam's apple is down to like probably about three or four inches long and um, right at the beginning of the summer holidays he was choking on a boiled sweet and they couldn't get it out of his throat and his mum is a nurse and his mum got a knife at home she did she slit his throat and she got a big pen like a, a bio, a, you know, disposable biro pen, pulled the middle out, so it was a clear plastic tube, and she put it in his throat so he could breathe. Then the ambulance turned up, they got the boiled sweet out of his throat, out of his mouth, wow. and then took him to hospital with this tube still in his throat, wow. and then sewed him back up. So his mum saved his life, we were all just like, your mum is amazing. He was like, I know, my mum saved my life. Anyway, how was your summer holidays, Dan? And I was like, yeah, wasn't that fucking cool? <laughs> That's fucking no. Well done, mum. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I just I always think of the him when I talk about tracheotomies or hear of tracheotomies. So just wanted to mention Michael there. Uh, Margaret sees a picture of herself, old Maggie, doesn't Ooh. she? And it, it basically, she's a picture of herself because it's the it's a person from yesteryear, and it's basically her. Yes. So basically, um, she finds out that uh, her like Mount olive is the son of that person in the picture um and there obviously there is a relation there because she it's kind of like when dracula finds his bride who looks exactly like his dead bride or when the mummy finds the woman that is a reincarnation of his bride from 500 years ago it's that kind of thing going on here thinking that's a reincarnation of the dude's mum but i thought the dude's a devil and stuff anyway yeah i'm it's again a weird isn't it <clears throat> I've only seen this film once before, so mm. there's some greyish areas mm. for me. Mm. Um, but but she, she's chatting away to the old Devil Rides Out guy, and he says, did you realise, if you remember, he didn't even have chicken? Yeah. She's like... <gasps> so he's almost someone that we can trust, because he's that's sort of saying... She, that's what she's trying to put across. She, it, it's quite funny at that point now that he's making him an outsider to the circle slightly more on yeah. her terms trying to put that trust across he, he's saying to her somebody i feel like somebody's he's, trying to take us all out he's kind of grooming her you know yeah for a reason yeah. well he says look here's a book all about the woman in the painting go go take go read it go uh, off to your room and read it and he stays there and thinks i'm just going to chill out here before i go to bed no you're not yeah, let me just... Oh, You're definitely not log, chilling out. That's that, sure. log's, that log's just fallen out of the fire. Let me just pick that back, pick that back up. up. Oh, no, it's a massive fireball fl- at me. Literally a flame sets for me it. on fire. Comes out, and he does a hereditary on him. He gets a <laughs> he gets a Gabriel Burns on him, and uh, he's set yep. on fire, and... Uh, and he burns. He yep. burns, and then we just see his burned remains, and then yep. a, cat ju- a cat just watches... Him, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cats don't care. Now, I didn't think this film would get any more brutal, but we'll get to what what the dogs do in a moment with those charred remains. Yeah, yeah. So Maggie reads the book. She reads it with Sam Elliott, and uh, he's starting to sort of come around and believe it now. The book's all about Satan worshippers, devil worshippers, reincarnation, and she's starting to understand what what is going on here and she shows pete the portrait and he's like they've got you screwed up here they are trying to trick you there's no way i'm just still confused by this they must be like at least pete must be he seems so awfully calm does he think he's getting getting out on the helicopter the next day is that what he's assuming when they leave and he's gonna leave with them because it must be like this is weird as fuck and i'm just sitting up here what's gonna happen i can't just be sitting up here chilling out waiting for something to happen how are we getting out of here like they fucked my bike can't drive out of here so they must be assuming the helicopter's their way out yeah well she says look let's go and speak to carl he's the one who gave me the book mm. they go back in the room and carl's not in there anymore yeah because i think they're going to speak to him obviously and say, i think they already did speak to him a little bit and say when you leave and now it's tomorrow afternoon blah, 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 blah. and i think he was gonna they go like we'll get on that as well but yeah not there but the, the they see the nurse leaving the room so they follow her out and when they get out of the room she's not there anymore it's a cat so we are starting to think maybe this nurse is the cat. Oh, no, I don't even know it's that bit. Yeah, 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 because yeah, it's a white, mm. she's all in white, the cat's white, yeah, yeah. and everywhere. Now, one thing I did notice is if the nurse has got different coloured eyes, because the cat's got two different coloured eyes, so if she has, then it's definitely the cat. But I interpret it as she's almost like um, the familiar 
for the devil. She, she's like, like a witch, has a black cat. The devil's got this white cat who's also his nurse helping him out. That's the way I see it. And the head of the household as well. Now, Maggie does some investigation in the office and she finds some, uh, some clippings from newspapers of all of the guests. They've each committed a crime or, or been involved in a death or a murder in some way. Somebody was involved in arson. That was Carl. Mm. Um, somebody else uh, was uh, the elite singer of a band died on stage from drugs. That was a band that Roger Daltrey dealt with. And they've all individually died. They've all individually um, been involved in a scandal that's been in the press, usually to do with the death. Uh, I believe a swimmer or somebody died um, that Maria was, was involved with. So that's a little plot point we'll come back to in a minute. Pete tries to steal the car. Well, he finds the car of the fireball man, basically. The devil rides out there. So it's a bit sketchy, doesn't it? When he you finds think so? Car. I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll get this car, that's fine. And then he sees a man walk into the middle of the courtyard and with just, a sack. And just dump out what the remains of the sack. And then he sets a load of Rottweilers out to eat the remains. Well, the dogs come out and try and attack Sam, first of all, which he runs away. But then they go back and just eat the... Yeah, I think they were there initially to eat the remains anyway. It just so happened. And Sam's there, and they chase him. But he manages to climb over a gate, and they, they, yeah, they just go back and eat the remains of the man, covering up the evidence. Now, what is it with what, what, Rottweilers in movies back in the uh, in the seventies and eighties? They used to get a bad rep, um, but all like in the newspaper, especially the Sun newspaper, always would have pictures of disfigured children who have been attacked by Rottweilers. They were really, you know, and again, any dog. It's the way it's been treated. Any dog, really, you know. Dog attacks are up 32% in the UK at the moment. Weird. Don't ask me how I know that fact. I do know that fact because I have children and me and my, my wife often wonder about letting dogs or vicious dogs near our kids and stuff. So right. we've got people close to us who've got a, a rescue dog and we wonder would we ever let, until they're a bit older, I don't, we don't think we'd let our children meet the rescue dog. Uh, it's a, it's a um, uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier rescue dog with scars all over it. Uh, no, not rescue dogs, no. Um, yeah. uh, dogs which uh, they've had since puppy, yeah. That's exactly the reason why uh, uh, I couldn't get a, uh, a rescue dog, because I had children. They had to give us a puppy, yeah. which was left, which we did get, which was beans. My beansy, beanie boy. He so puked, puked up all over my bed last night in massive chunks. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, fucker. I miss him. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him next month. I don't know if you see him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's going to do horrible smelly farts when I'm sitting around watching TV? I can do it. Brilliant. Are you going to lick your balls as well? If you're lucky. Okay, not mine, your own, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, he uh, mm -hmm. escapes from the, Sam Elliott escapes from the Rottweilers, as you say. They eat the remains. He climbs in a window and he... Maggie's like, what the... What's going on? What, are you OK? And he's like... Oh, oh, I've just, just been chased by a load of Rottweilers. They were biting my steel butt. Luckily, my bum's made of steel, but I managed to get away. Titanium buttocks. The dogs have all lost their teeth on his buttocks. But, anyway, uh, he, gets, he tells her what happened. He says, I think they ate a body. I can't. Um, but I did find in the child remains a ring. And I think it was Carl. Something's happened to Carl because he finds the ring in the child remains, isn't he? I love the fact that he, it's really weird that he, he, he finds this, which is on a dead person's finger, a moment ago, and he puts it on his own finger to show it to her. Just to carry it. Not in a handkerchief in your pocket? Just to put it actually on your finger? Weird. Maggie works out that these people are all dying the way that they were involved in scandals, like I say just now arson they're all everything that they've done in their past so they've basically committed a crime to obtain the devil's power but the devil's basically decided he what well, he's had enough of them now and they're all getting taken out one at a time um and uh, she says the punishment fits the crime she says the only thing i can't find is anything on jacques uh, and there's nothing on me obviously here either so they go and talk to um, Barbara, Nurse Adams, and while they're doing that, Jacques sneaks downstairs. Do, 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 do. That's me sneaking. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. They tell Barbara they think that Jacques might be the killer, and uh, the um, they call for the chauffeur, 
And Shark, while they're doing this, Shark may well be the killer because he grabs a gun, doesn't he, Gav? Yeah. And he get he loads up this gun, and uh, he takes it up onto the roof. I know it turns into some sort of fucking sniper thing at the moment. I know. Well, Maggie and Pete they have a little drink downstairs as you do, and they hear hear <coughs> hear cats again, and uh. Barbara is killed by an exploding mirror. Yeah, well, what's happened? They've gone to... <clears throat> this is weird, because when they go visit Barbara, they they feel like she's the only one who is slightly not possibly with them, and it's a hard thing to do. At this point to him, it's a, almost like the thing. Who do you trust? Yeah. So they go to her, and it's all a bit like, is she legit wanting to ring the chauffeur? And she calls the chauffeur says, I want to leave now. Because she sort of believes them, but I was, it's the whole time you're like, you better we believe that she believes that? But she legitimately does, because you know that, because what you just said, she looks in the mirror, and the mirror goes bang. And she's killed by the glass in yeah. her face. Yeah, um, so um, she did want to get going, and she did believe them, but it's too late now. So it's back to just Sam and Maggie now. Yeah, so Sam Elliott grabs a gun from well, the hallway. Well, Maggie looks up and sees blood coming from the chandelier. Yeah, dripping down into a glass. Mm. Quite quite a cool scene, actually, that. Yeah, Sam finds her crying, obviously. Like, what the fuck? You know. So he's got a gun. Um, she's very upset. Uh, she says, I think this is all my fault. I think I'm the reason this is happening. Yeah. Um, I was the last one to see each of them alive. So, so Pete... It's the morning then, so they sort of go outside. Don't they? Well, they don't just go outside. He carries her like a really burly man down the stairs and out the front door. Because that's what Sam Elliott does. But we've got Sniper on the roof. Sniper on the roof. Shark's up on the roof with a gun. Starts shooting at them. I love this, though. This is where we go back into action here again, where Sam manages to <clears throat> sort of use a car for cover and then get to a place where there's crossbows. He mm. gets a fucking crossbow. Big Mo Man gets a crossbow. Yep. He, there's a bit of backwards and forwards shooting, and Pete gets actually gets shot in the chest by an arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, Pete shoots no, Jock in the yeah, chest yeah, with an yeah, arrow. Yeah, yeah. Jack, Jock manages to pull it out, and then Pete gets shot because he's distracted by Maggie. Um, and then because uh, Maggie throws some kind of a devil curse on Jock, she looks up at him angrily, and his gun suddenly seals up, doesn't it? The, yeah, we don't know if it's her, but I assume it must be her. Yeah, the barrel just closes up. Well, I up. assume as each of the circle get less and less, the power's divided by less people. So she's the last one left now. So it, she's now got all the power. It's quite annoying, though. When she comes out straight away, she goes, Sam! Well, she doesn't say Sam, because that's his actual real actor name. But it's Pete. Like, Pete! And, which makes him look round and get grazed by the bloody shot in the ear. If she hadn't said that, he would have probably fucking shot him, been all right. So it was a bit weird that she comes out, makes a fuck up of it, and but then goes and puts her magic on it anyway because I guess she's a bit like oh I'm pissed off with you but I don't know. I suppose that so makes his, sense. His gun explodes. He goes firing down through the roof and lands in the swimming pool dead. Maggie did it and she says it is me. It was me. I am the one. Mm. Um, she goes to visit Jason Mount Olive and she says to him they're all dead. He <laughs> says I I know. She inherits now Satan's power. Yeah. Wow. He says, now you must go and find six souls, six new souls to help you and inherit Satan's power to pass the legacy. Take my legacy and pass it on. So the way it works is you always have six people under you. Uh, who were uh, the ring bearers, like Lord of yeah. the Rings or something. And they do your bidding for you. Uh, and well, then they've all probably got their people below them as well and they get i guess they get something out of it which is like whatever they want power yeah or you've got to commit an, an awful crime like they've all done but it means that you'll get well, she's a got, ri rich riches beyond your wildest dreams yeah she's got made this and at the end of it sam goes and puts a ring on as well so he's one of them does that mean he has to go off and do some crime with his yeah. buttocks yeah it right. does it does Buttock burger, um, buttock burglary one of my favourite little moments now, towards the end here, um, Pete fights the nurse. So Sam Elliott fights the nurse. And while they're fighting, the nurse goes, Meow! So she's definitely the cat, because she starts making cat sounds. Um, she falls downstairs I've dead. Got, I've got Sam destroys stuff. Yeah, well, he heads up to... Um, 
the uh like the medical room doesn't he and he just starts trashing everything starts fucking shit up he throws everything around uh maggie rises up completely unscathed and says pete because everything sets on fire and blows out but she's not hurt she says pete come with me she picks up the cat and she says come on adams come with me adams so the nurse adams and the cat's called adams oh okay she goes down into the uh, the sort of the staff room and says, "Good morning, staff." It's the, like it's meant to be. She's done it a million times, and all the staff are there waiting for their head of house to uh, come and say hello. And the cat walks out of the room, and the nurse Adams walks back into the room. She mm. seems to be alive, even though she just got thrown down the stairs by Pete. She's alive. And uh, Maggie gives Pete the ring, and he says, "Will it ever come off?" And she's like, "Well, <laughs> we'll have to see." And then she just says, when I, I kill you, she says, I've got this power and I can do anything I want. And he's like, oh, and it kind of ends like, Wait, why I did really, you, you made that very sexual. I don't know. I like the ending here because normally the goodies, the good guys don't succumb to the evil. But here they're like, you know what? This could be pretty cool. We, we've got anything we want here. Yeah, it's not Rosemary's baby and Rosemary's like, oh, no, I don't like this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is like, oh, cool, my baby's the de- demon. That's or great. Edward Woodward being set on fire. No. Yeah, Wood- yeah, cool, fun film. Uh, I do recommend but it. What I've, what I've, my last note is, in saying that, though, because we, we know that intrinsically they are quite good people, these two. They have the chance here to use this power for good if they want. So it's kind of left, really, with you wondering. Well, I certainly wondered, she, will they use this power for good or bad? Yeah, because she is a nice person. At yeah. no point does she ca- her character come across as And Sam's a, a nice guy, time. you know. Mm, uh, yeah. p- apart from perving on women swimming, he's quite a nice guy. Yeah, probably stopped, apart from fucking everything that walks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do recommend it. I, w- I kind of... It's a 6 out of 10 for me, and I wish it was like a 7.5. I wish it just had something else to make it a bit more. Maybe, like, the music supervisor done a better job with the music or music score or something in it just to give it that little bit more or a bit tighter in places. I don't know. I'm not sure because it is kind of half horror, half action almost. Yeah, it's got some really cool uh, 70s action moments in it. Hmm. Um, I think and that's it, again, Sam Elliott in it, and I think they probably possibly... Uh, uh, did that a little bit for again the audience uh, like uh, having his buttocks in it is the same as like having him have a fight sequence quite a few I, fights I would say that when they hired Sam Elliott they added some bits to the script like horse riding motorcycle yeah, riding he does fight a lot of people yeah I, I should imagine you know oh can you ride a horse yeah great we'll write in a scene great can you ride a motorcycle yeah great we'll pop that in it so but it works um mm. i gave it a six as well but i would probably if though if imdb allowed it i would give it a 6.5 mm. it's very close to a seven for me i actually think with more viewings of it which i intend to watch this again in future it might go up a bit i um, agree i could i could imagine like growing up with this film and even the changeling oh, God, yeah. which i love i didn't actually grow up with i was sort of late to come into the changeling um, but I think growing up with this, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is the one. It's in my DVD collection. Oh, I feel like a movie. Like, oh, I, like the other night, I was like, I want to watch a movie. I'll put on Dracula's Prince of Darkness because it's, it's one of those movies from the, when I was a kid. Do you know what I mean? I can just, it's comfort. It's just put, not no, I don't to, need to think about it. I've seen it a million times. Yeah. Just put it uh, on. Uh, not, not to speak for Kevin, but I should imagine he feels comfortable watching this because the setting, the house, the people. Yeah. You've seen this movie a dozen times. Remote, you you remote feel like location, you know everything. Group of people. Yeah. It's nothing to to. It's, a, co- it's a cozy film. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And if you ever get a chance to go to England, Kev, there's, you know, there's, these places are fucking everywhere. Yeah. Mm. Can, can, can let us know and we'll take you to a weird mansion. <laughs> can't, can't guarantee that you'll get... Um, Either Sam Sam Elliott in a shower or a weird ring from Satan, but you'll at least see a cat. How's that for a promise? <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway, I did enjoy that, listeners. Please really do it. check it out. It, we like in the UK. The UK YouTube uh, it is on there. I don't know worldwide. Obviously, it's different territories have different rules. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't find think it's that hard to get hold of. Um, and audio yourself well, a DVD. I rented it. I rented or, or, it on yeah, Prime. Or rent it, yeah. No, I found a copy on YouTube, which is a pretty good copy. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. I saw that, but I ended up renting it. I thought, bugger it, I'll spend a couple of quid on it. Well, yeah, that's what, we're, that's what our patron, patron fund is for, for movies. Um, <clears throat> worth watching, I reckon, guys. If you're into the set, I'm a big fan of 70s films, 60s, to be honest, a lot of the decades, really. Um, but I do like 70s movies, especially this sort of This feels film. like it. It came out the same mould as The Omen, Rosemary's, Rosemary's Baby, those it, kind of movies. It, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really good stuff. Oh, Bill Murray's just walked in. Hello, Bill. Why are you wearing a wrestling costume? Why is he in, like, a little, like, Mexican, like, mask, you know, one of those... Oh, I have no idea. El, El Abisto type thing. What is going on with you? You all you've right? Been, you've been doing what? Wrestling. Why are you wrestling? Side hustle. Okay. Right, okay. I mean, do you think that they think that he's good, so they bet on him, and then, or he's bad? I reckon what he does is he puts on that um, mask, and then a different person comes out and wrestles. It's a bit gimp-like. I don't yeah. think it's very wrestler-like. It's the zip on the mouth, Bill, that's it, doing it. It is. Get rid of the zip, but then it's just a big open mouth, and I don't think that's good either, really, Bill. Don't know about this side hustle. Anyway... <laughs> Why don't you take interested. us into World of the Strange, Bill? Come on, Bill. Please. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. World of the Strange. Oh, it's World of the Strange, huh? World of the Strange. Yeah, bloody world of the bloody strange. Bloody world of strange. Well, uh, related to um, our movies, which are films set in spooky haunted houses, I have one story that you sent me, Gav, yeah, here about um, a haunted house, but also off the back of that, mm. I've got a little list of spooky tales. Just a quick list of spooky tales. Excellent. More will be revealed as we get to it. So first of all, let's do the main story, which the headline is... Terrified Scottish mum says ghost is haunting her home after her daughter has seen a monster in her bedroom. So this is very recent. Okay. A few months ago. Um, the young mum from Glasgow, Scotland, claims that a spirit is playing with her kids' toys while they're sound asleep as she regularly hears her taps being turned on and banging in the night as well as the baby gate creaking open and shut. She got any put any cameras up? She should be, really, shouldn't she? Well, yeah, yeah fuck yeah. Uh, so she's convinced of this. Uh, also, her daughter says she spotted a monster in her bedroom. The 27-year-old mum has even thought about asking a priest or a psychic medium for help, as the problem has escalated so much that even her friends won't stay the night. Okay. I think by friends, I'm wondering if they mean men that she wants to stay over. I'm not sure. Special friends. Special friends. Mummy's friends special friends are over again. All five of them. Oh, my God. Gav, you took, put a twist on this story. Is that what the banging in the night is? Could be. Um, the young mum claims a spirit is playing with her children's toys while they're asleep. Uh, she believes she saw a ghostly shadow in the house. Her three-year-old has been suffering from terrible nightmares. She sees monsters regularly in her bedroom. Uh, she said, I don't want to be identified in this story. I want to protect my children's identity. But I am considering moving home. She says, it's always when my eldest is home and in bed. It's been happening for a few months now. But different things happening each time. It started a few months back. The taps in the kitchen were turning on and off on their own. The fridge door was left open. It's not like a teenage boy just getting really drunk say, and stoned. It sounds like a teenager. Just walking through the house. Off. Fuck! Did you do that? that, that I don't think so, Mum. Well, she's hearing banging in the middle of the night. That's the fucking drunk kid making she's a ham sandwich. The fr fridge door has been left open. Ham sandwich. Taps have been left on. Water under the fountain because he's fucking... Oh, I'm so thirsty. Creaking from the baby gate. That's just him trying to be... i sne oh, sneakily go to bed. And they've heard noises on the baby monitor and the toys being played with. Hello, baby brother. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> she says, I saw a shadow at the corner of my eye one night going into bed. <laughs> Is he drunk, son? <laughs> this boy would be a son. It'd be a daughter's boyfriend. Ah, uh, drunk daughter's boyfriend, sorry. 
She says, it gives me the fear. The most recent thing was my littlest one's toys were being played with and it doesn't take batteries. So it was just started making a noise on its own even though there was no batteries in it. I don't know how the drunken boyfriend's doing that. She said, it's a very loud toy. I heard it in the hallway being moved around and I thought, well, that's odd because my daughter's in bed. I've got a six-month-old and a three-month-old with a baby monitor and they were nowhere near the toy at the time. Do you reckon the drunken boyfriend's just got really good at ventriloquism or such and doing impressions that he's doing impressions of a toy playing around and moving around? Maybe. That'd be good, wouldn't it? She said she was at her father's last night and he'd messaged to say she'd had another nightmare. Did I know anything about this monster? Hmm. I never speak about ghosts or monsters to my little girl because it creeps me out. I don't have any footage of it before you ask. There we go, Gav. She's depending. Anytime no, anything happened, I'd just grab my child and bring them into the bed with me rather than record. No, I would be recording cameras, that shit. Get cameras up in the house. Just get a GoPro. Whack it up, you know, in the bedroom. You say just get a GoPro, though. You're looking at three, four hundred quid. Is it like they might not have that, you know. Yeah, just nick one. <laughs> She said she came into my bed a few weeks back, a few weeks back, and she was staring at the corner of my room, saying, "Shh, mummy, the monster's asleep." Mm-hmm. Christ, that's a bit spooky, isn't it? I freaked out, and I said to her, "What's going on? Tell me again. You're not making any sense." She said the same thing. She says my friends won't come into the house anymore. I've messaged my friends and said I need someone to stay over with me. They said no way. I wouldn't blame them, to be honest with you. I always go to bed early for the nursery run. So I have to be, I've been awake pretty late the past few times because of this. It's, a, it's affecting all of our sleep. She says she's considered speaking to a psychic medium or a priest. This is going to get good in a minute. You're going to love this. Um, she said if things stop, then I won't consult them. But it's getting to the point I am going to have to ring them. Well, ring them then. Stop t- saying you're going to give them a call stop, and do it. Stop trying to get fucking hits for doing the interviews in the newspaper. She said, I'm not sure if a medium would come out to my house. I would pay for it, though. But you won't pay um, for a GoPro. Now we have a photo of George the Medium. George the that? Medium? Yep. Is that his name? Is that his title? George the Medium, yep. All right. Jo- so George the Medium, an astrologist and psychic based in Glasgow, has given his thoughts to us, the mm-hmm. newspaper. And what is that? I can't wait. Go on. And he's even offered to visit the family free of charge to help them. Oh, well, all right. Great. He says, well, firstly, I'd like to say sorry that this is happening to you. That's helpful, isn't it, Gav? Secondly, I know people will find this hard to believe, especially when they are going through things that make them feel uncomfortable and scared. But most of the time, this is actually family or friends who are in a spirit trying to let you know they're there. But he's not actually gone there, he's just giving them no. words of advice. But he says, I'll happily come down, but I'm just going to give you words of advice. But hang on, you said you'd come down, why don't you come down? No, there's words of advice. The fact that others can feel the presence of our past on ones shows that the presence of the spirit is strong. Right. Most of it will not be negative. Hmm. I always suggest that people should call out to the loved ones, if this happens, to take away the negatives and cover us all in love and light. Barry, why are you doing this to me? Stop leaving the fridge open. I was so good to you. I did anything you wanted. All the food's gone off. Barry, the ghost, leave me in peace. Uh, It says young children are especially sensitive to this kind of thing. It's not really understood why, but they just are. Uh, The feeling of negative energy is just something that we we mistake sometimes. So he's just talking a load of nonsense here. Um, Go down and visit like you said you would. He says electrical equipment is easy to for spirits to interfere with things like baby monitors they love playing with it what do you mean what have you spoken to some spirits and they've gone yeah we love fucking around with the baby monitors he must be saying that they love it because it must be the most frequent thing he sees happen but then he says i'm more than happy to go and see this family and help if i can come on then i would never charge and says it again yeah he says but no genuine medium would charge George the Medium. The young woman has thanked George the Medium <laughs> and says she plans to contact him. Curious George. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's so hope we get a development story, from that. That story isn't that great, but I thought it was funny. But off the back of that story, it did make me come up with a list of the creepiest 
uh, imaginary friends that children have talked about. Nice. You ready for this? Mm, mm. Okay. So here we go. They've all got a name as well. So number one is the Creeper Man. Yep. My son, from the age of three, always tells me about the Creeper Man who lives in my mum and dad's bedroom. He brings it up whenever they come and visit. I made the mistake once of saying to him, well, what does the Creeper Man look like? And my son just said, well, he doesn't have a face. I don't know. Nice. Number two. This one's called The Captain. This, this is a good one. A parent of one of my students told us in a meeting that she was concerned, concerned for her seven-year-old son because he always talked about an invisible ghost who talks to him and plays with him at night in his room. He said the ghost is called the captain. He was an old white man with a beard. The kid would say to his mum that the captain said to him, when you grow up, your job's going to be to kill people and I will tell you who needs to be killed. The kid would cry and say, but I don't want to kill anybody when I grow up. And the captain says, well, you don't have a choice. It's, you're, you, need, you need to do it. I'm using you to kill these people. Get a schizophrenic test for your child ASAP. Jesus Christ. You don't have a choice. That's, that's not good. No. No. Number three, Kelly in the closet. Kelly in the closet or Kelly and mm. the closet? Kelly in inside the closet. Ew. When my daughter was three, she had an imaginary friend named Kelly who lived in her closet. Kelly sat in a little rocking chair while she slept. She played with her typical imaginary friend stuff. Anyway, fast forward two years later, the wife and I are watching the new Amateurville film, the one with Ryan Reynolds, and our daughter walks out right when the dead girl goes all black-eyed. Mm. My daughter doesn't even freak out. She just points at the telly and says, Oh, that looks like Kelly. Uh, and they said, well, who's Kelly? You know, the dead girl that lives in my closet. Uh, Jesus Christ. That's not what I, you want, that's not what I, you want uh, when you're uh, just watching a movie. I don't want... My, my kids don't come out with this kind of stuff. I'm sure they will, though. Uh, Daisy wake me up in the middle of the night last night. Not last night, I was dead asleep. And I don't even know what I said to her. I said the next day, I don't even know what you're talking to me about. And she goes, oh, I made you go to my room and check my closet and underneath my bed. I think she thinks she'd be watching too much true crime on YouTube. Dear me. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember any of it. I think I just walked in the room and walked back out and went, yeah, clear. <laughs> Going back to <laughs> bed, for fuck's sake. Nothing it is. <laughs> uh, number four, Bad Rabbit. My cousin, when she was five and I was 17, had a stuffed rabbit and she used to talk to it and carry it everywhere. One day, she was asleep on the couch while I was watching her. She woke up and started yelling at a rabbit for no reason. One minute, she was knocked out. The next, she's awake, glaring at a rabbit, yelling, No! No! You can't do that! That's bad! Don't do it! I asked her what was wrong and I tried to stop her screaming and shouting, but she wouldn't listen. I finally just took the rabbit up to her room. And when I came back down, she was asleep on the couch again. I don't think anything of that. I think that I think she woke up and she's still in a little bit of dreamland. <clears throat> Fair enough. Oh, yeah, she's going back upstairs, come back down, and she's asleep again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, how about it's number not five? not like the dead child in the fucking cupboard, is it? I had a, I had a go at a rabbit. Oh. Or the captain that says, when you grow up, you're going to kill people yeah, for me. Yeah, like, you know, I had a go at a rabbit. Number five, Roger. All right, what's Roger up to? My little brother's imaginary friend, Roger, lived under our coffee table. All right. Roger had a wife and nine kids. Underneath the coffee table is a bit of a yeah. tight squeeze. Roger and his family lived peacefully alongside us for three years, but one day my little brother announced Roger won't be around anymore since he shot and killed his whole family. Wow, underneath the table as well. I don't know if he remembers any of this, but his lack of remorse when he told us it was very disturbing. Jesus. Kids are nuts, aren't they? <laughs> it's a bit much, isn't it? Number six, Jack. Oh. Oh. An exchange between one of uh, the students in my student teaching placement and myself. Me. What do you want to write about, student? Jack. Me. Oh, who's Jack? Her. He's my invisible friend. Me. Oh, tell me something about Jack. Her. He's dead. Brilliant. <laughs> okay then Deirdre you go play over there 
I'm and aside the, the room. Dead friend with you. You go play with your buddy. Okay. Number seven is the dead cousin. Okay. My cousin died when he was six, and my brother was maybe two or three months old. When he was about three, my brother started playing with those little car mats with the towns on them. Nice. Got one right in front of me here, actually. Yeah, I haven't got one anymore. Uh, he used to talk to himself. My mum said, who are you playing with? And he said, my dead cousin. That's a bit creepy. Okay. Number eight, Franny and the red dress. Not Fanny, Franny. My little brother used to talk about a woman who would visit his room at night. He said she wore a red dress, her name was Franny, and she would sing to him, and that she floats. Mm. Well, I actually had a relative who died years before he was born, named Fanny, so close, and her favourite colour was red, and she was buried in a red dress. We showed him the picture of her, and he said, yes, that's the lady that visits me and sings to me. Oh, weird. He also said that a man named Jacob sometimes dressed up like a lumberjack and slept in my bed. Oh my God, don't tell me that a man's getting in my bed in the middle of the night. A lumberjack. A ghostly lumberjack. It's a bit of a weird one. Spooky. Somebody once told me, uh, somebody who's very psychic and believes in, in all of this stuff, and I believe in a lot of this stuff, he said to me, <clears throat> you've got a girl with you all the time. Okay. Is I she, said, what do, what do you mean? You, is she with you now, then? I don't know. This was about 15 years ago at one of my old jobs. I said, what do you mean? And he said, there's a girl about this high with dark hair, green eyes, and she is with you everywhere. I can see her now. And I was like, I don't, what? And he described my friend Laura, who passed away about 18 years ago. She had dark hair. She was quite short. She had green eyes. Weird. If there's anybody with Dan now, that picture behind Don't his head, can you move it. it slightly for me? I hope not, because it's... I'll watch it. I'll keep on it. <clears throat> i got two more of these, and then uh, I'm getting scared. Oh, your camera moved, and I thought it was rocking. It was your actual camera. Oh, that's it. And I was like, it moved. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. So, number nine. The hmm. evil is coming. The evil is coming. When my oldest daughter was two or three, she used to have a couple of imaginary friends. One called Dodo and one called Dee Dee. Dodo and Dee Dee. That's what Jack calls Edith. My son calls my daughter Edith because he can't say Edith, he calls her Dee Dee. These were just two typical imaginary friends. She'd talk to them, she'd play with them, and she'd tell me about their lives. Then one day, when she was about three, she was talking on her play phone. I walked into the room and she hung up on her phone and said to me, with a completely flat voice, the evil is coming. Was she fucking Donald Pleasant? And I said, what, what do you mean the evil is coming? She said, one of my friends is called the evil. <laughs> and, he, and, it, and he's coming. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know about the second bit, but uh, yeah, it's a bit weird. It's called the evil. I'm coming! So, they're all been quite scary so far. Quite scary uh, you know, names. Number ten. Greg. <laughs> Greg's. I asked my six-year-old son what he was doing. He said, oh, I'm playing with Greg. Fuck off. My, it's my imaginary <laughs> friend. I said to him, well, what are you guys doing? My son said, we're making babies. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> How's Greg making babies with you, son? Yeah, well. I, don't think that, I don't think she asked anymore, really. Uh, there is a bonus one, number 11, the last one. The Angel of Death. It's a fucking slayer. When my brother was little, he would always act like he had angels talking to him. One day, my mum overheard him saying to himself, I can't kill him, he's my dad. Oh, Fucking hell. I've heard my kids say weird things, but uh, that's a little... That's a little lock up the knives department. Yeah. Mm. Well, there we go. That's a list of imaginary friends nice, on the back man. of the story yeah. that Gav sent us about the haunted Scottish house. If anybody uh, in Scotland is suffering from a uh, haunted or house or podcast, please contact George the Medium. Yeah. He'll probably do it for free. Probably. He, well, he says he will to get the hits, but he won't actually turn up. Yeah. Oh, there's like the a train old, uh, delay. Oh, really now? What, what, like the, uh, if it's a translate, how did you not know that? Thought you were a fucking psychic. 
he wants to be um, the next um, what are they what are they called the family from the the conjuring and all of that. You know the, the, the Warrens. Yeah, he wants to be the next Warrens. He's trying to be the the Scottish Warrens. I think. <laughs> What's he called? Norman. George, George the medium. George. Um, well, he's free, but I tell you, who isn't free. It's Bill Murray. So Bill. That's because he's wrestling all the time and his bondage clothing. Yeah, but we pay for him to fly over here every episode. I've just... got to admit, I don't think that's a wise way of the Patreon funds being spent. I don't. I, I agree with you. But it's a they... it's a fun thing for us to see him like this. Like, no one else can see this, but you know. Bill. Well, that that's one of the strengths of Bill. Take us out of here, please. Thank you, Bill. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though. Give me iron. Hairless pets. Weird. Within this old house live two residents. One of them is John Russell, composer, professor. The other has been dead for over 70 years. <laughs> Claire, I'd like to talk to you about the house. Did you die in this house? How did you die? Whatever it is, it's trying desperately to communicate. What is it in that house, Claire? What is it doing? Why is it trying to reach me? from 1980. After the death of his wife and daughter in a car crash, a music professor staying at a long vacant Seattle mansion is dragged into a decades-old mystery by an inexplicable presence in the mansion's attic. Very good. Almost got stumped. Uh, Kevin says, The Changeling, 1980. He puts, How did you die, Joseph? Did you die in this house? Why do you remain? He says, about as perfect as a horror movie poster can be. A tragic, what-the-fuck opening prologue. The best and scariest seance sequence of any film ever. The house itself, scary as fuck. As a kid, I wanted to play hide-and-seek in there, and I still do. Uh, some crazy plot twists dealing with family drama, and, and he put this bit in capital letters, the red ball sequence. No more needs to be said. He says, the scariest movie moment of my childhood and one I retell on the regular. Yep. Yes, so I came to the party late on this one too, as did Gav. I watched this for the first time four or five years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, I was told by Gav, I was told by Ricky Morgan and a couple of other people in podcasting and fr through friends if you haven't seen this movie what are you doing get on it get on it so i watched it i thought it's fantastic i've probably seen it three times now this this being my probably my fourth watch of it and i will say it gets scarier with every watch and i don't know any movie that i can say that about this old, that's this old 
there's something about it that gets right under my skin. But we'll get to that as we go through the movie. Gav, you relate to the party too, weren't you? Mm. I don't remember at first watching it. I think with this film, it's because there's a, quite a few things in it. So you just keep seeing new things as you go along with it. Um, yeah, well, I was, and I've always been into the, um, you know, the, the movies, The Legend of Hill House or uh, Hell House, sorry. Um, there's, there's all those sorts of movies. What is it? The Haunting. There's <clears throat> all lots of these sorts of films. Always been a fan of these movies. And this one, I don't know why. Um, I don't even know if I'd known. This is probably where I first seen maybe Paul Guys 3. Not Paul Guys 3. Um, Exorcist 3. I didn't know if I'd seen George C. Scott before, really. But, like, I just... I don't know. The movie has is working on multiple levels. And um, there's something with it where I've just felt I was just really into. I think it's the simplicity of like the ball rolling down the stairs. It's such a simple fucking thing, but the way it's it's uh, crafted just brings a, a real sophisticated creepiness to it. You know? Yeah, it's a very sophisticated. It's up there with again Rosemary's Baby, uh, The Omen, The Exorcist. These are horror movies that have a level, a pedigree, a level of pedigree to them. There's a polish to them. I need to get this on Blu-ray. Um, you know, Kevin Bacon's Stir of Echoes. That's pretty much this storyline. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and this Good film movie. was the inspiration for Tape Three. Did you know? Mm. Obviously, did you notice that? Obviously. I did. I very, did very that. obvious. That, two scenes in this film pretty much inspired that film. If you've not, if you've seen this and you love that movie, and you've not seen the short film we made, only if like six months ago, um, it's on the Deadbolt Film Channel. It's close to the top, and you, you'll be going, "Oh, okay, it's, a, it's set in the eighties. It's an investigator. There's a seance and a real to real machine, you know, and smoking and all that stuff." And this is what I love about this film. It's just. It's got that seance scene. Is that is could be like I made a short film from it anyway. Could be a short film in itself. It's so creepy the way she's just writing down what's happening and stuff. Um, and I don't know what it is with this film, but you're right. It does well, have a thing which keeps coming back to you each time you view it. Like you're saying, does make it a bit more scary. I was scared watching this this time around. I think what what it is is this movie is is actually less a horror movie, more a mystery. Yeah. an investigation yeah it's got that too it, yeah. it's an episode of Columbo an episode of whatever you want and that's what and I know you are really into those I Gav and I am oh, too I'm thinking of Columbo but, in a haunted house but what they've done is this mystery element also this mystery um, story also has a supernatural undertone and underbelly all the way through a revenge the re, like a spirit that wants revenge mm -hmm. and just happens to have a couple of extremely creepy moments in it that george c scott being the actor he is played extremely well yeah uh, and and every in fact everybody in this is acts incredibly well it's polished so nicely like i said it's got a fantastic score a really great score um, it's directed by Peter Medak. I feel like, even because I, I, I'm on multiple groups of horror groups on Facebook, because that's, that's kind of why I use Facebook. I don't use it for like just seeing people's statuses so much. I, I like all the horror groups. And, and multiple times people will be like, give us a, an unrated, uh, uh, um, an unknown movie or a movie I've not heard or a spooky movie. And loads of people will be able to change it. And people are like, oh, what's this? I don't know this. And it feels like it just doesn't get... Uh, what the omen gets and stuff like that yeah. it's almost it's kind of just that. hidden away behind the dusty dvds and videos back there somewhere and go oh, what's this movie you change it then but yes yeah, great if you haven't uh, seen it please please watch it before we get into it and peter medak famously went on to direct um species two <laughs> Among many other things, but that's the strange movie that he directed. He also directed some episodes of Tales from the Crypt. He directed the Craze film. Oh, well, the, uh, uh, oh, uh, the, with my, the uh, twins. Yeah, 1990. Um, and no, lots I, and I, lots and lots of TV. Just the audience now, I know the Craze were twins. I meant the actors that played them. Who was it? It was, um, was it Matt and... The Kemp. Oh, Kemp yeah, Brothers. it wasn't Matt and Luke Goss from Bros. No, no. It, was the, it was them from Spandau Ballet. Yeah. 
Funny enough, Gav, he also directed episodes of Magnum P.I. Sweet. Remington Steel with old Pierce Brosnan. I'm going to have to watch the episodes of Magnum P.I. you directed. Um, the Saint. Yep. The Professionals. So he did do some detective-y, mystery-type TV stuff as well. So that probably why this feels a bit like that. Um but yeah, his main films were The Changeling, Species 2, and The Craze. Strange selection of films. Really to fucking strange. <laughs> um, yeah, George has got greatness. That morning he wakes up and he's just sobbing. Oh my God, that broke me, man. Um, we'll come to that in a minute. but that... yeah, We'll we come to all of it, but it's just, it, this film just, it just jumps up there at a high level. And it's the just o- so <laughs> unknown, I feel. The opening of this movie, the opening scene, what happens in it is is up there with Pet Cemetery and the truck and the boy. Um, let's, just, let's just go for it. Yeah, so we start in upstate New York. It's snowing. George, uh, John Russell is his character's name. We're just going to call him George because, you know, we all know George. George is there with his wife and daughter and the car's broken down in the snow. And they're all having a bit of a laugh, pushing the car along. He seems like a really good dad, doesn't he? Sort of making them laugh. And... He seems like a jolly, jolly fella. He seems a bit old for a young kid, gotta say. Right, well, hang on, Gav. I'm, I'm 45. He and I've seems got... a bit older than you, my friend. Okay. It does seem like, he, you know, he's not going to be in 10 years running around playing football. That's true. You know. Mind you, I probably won't be. But anyway, he... He, he should be. If I can look at, look at old Sylvester Stallone and those guys... What they're up to? I'm, I'm no action hero. <laughs> You're no eighties action hero, Gav. Jesus. Um, anyway, he says, "Look, you guys wait with the car. I'm going to go use that payphone over there, just on the other side of the highway. I'm going to call for help because we just got to get somebody out to tow the car." Mum and daughter say, "Well, we're going to have a snowball fight. Ha ha ha! It's all fun and lovely." And he's like, oh, "Look at my lovely family." Ring, ring on the payphone. Truck comes along, doesn't it, Gav? Well, there's a car coming down one way, and there's a truck coming down the other way. The, the truck is fucking pelting it, so I'm presuming it's got its snow tires on. That's for sure. I snow chains, so. because that truck is fucking going fast. And George notices that, looks back, sees the car, looks back at Lloyd, looks over to his family, looks and keeps looking back and forwards, and it's cut back and forwards, back and forwards, and the car loses control. And the truck tries to dodge the car, and the car and the truck both go into his parked car. You don't see, though, um, obviously it's an old movie, and it would have been, wouldn't been hard to do effects. You could have had, like, scarecrow-type people stand there. But you don't see where they are positioned when they get hit. Um, that's they the were only right thing behind the car, though. The last, I guess we last saw video. them right behind the car. Right. So. And they basically are taken out, and he's just there, just, like, shock. And that's... Boom! There's your opening of the film. And the changing just pops up on screen. Yeah. And the credit the credits start rolling. Yeah, you're yeah, in, he you're can... in setting the tone for a film. There you go, guys. <laughs> Fuck you know. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm. I put here, whoa, what a start to a movie. I let my mum the other night misery. Oh god. I was like, check this out, you love this one. I've gave her a bunch of DVDs and she rang me up ecstatically. We watched that movie last night. Oh my god, Gavin. And what he she did to his ankle Oh my god. Go on. <laughs> she's just ecstatic though she kept it's going so on good. about it then when i went to see her she kept going on about it again i was like oh you like that one didn't you oh it's so good and i was explaining stephen king had an accident and he came he came up with the idea and he given her a... but yeah but anyway this film with that car crash like that it's kind of with misery it's kind of a bit like that it's just a massive car crash setting off the, the catalyst for what's going on um and george you know is a total shock really he needs yeah. to have a complete change of scenery, a change of life, a change of pace, because he wants to, you know, he's, he's tough, man. He's a, he is a strong dude. Like, the fact well, that he, he's like, right, I'm going to do this, he's like, whoa, man, you know. He lets, when he's on his own, he lets his guard down. We see that a few times, but yeah, like, when he's out and about it. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, we see him present day now, so this is a few months later, and he's walking along, walking through New York. He's got his briefcase. He's just going about his business. Um, he arrives at um, uh, an empty apartment. It, it seems seemingly the apartment that he lived in with his wife 
and his daughter. Obviously, they're both now dead. It's being so he's selling up. up. Yep. yep. Selling up. He's moving out. Um, he looks around the room and he sort of thinks about things. And then a ball drops out of one of the boxes, a red bouncing ball. And he picks and it up because it was his kid's up. ball. And he thinks, oh, my daughter. And he remembers her briefly. And it's... This is one of the things. And this movie does show this lots because it kind of really does show you obviously what happens when a loved one does pass and just like the the memories that you're going to get by touching things seeing things smelling things eating things hearing things you're just going to have a lot of memories and um and he has this through this movie and it's obviously quite powerful what's happened and you know yeah yeah, I don't even know how he's walking around, to be honest That's with you. That's what I'm saying. Um, I don't understand how he can move like that, but he does come across as a really powerful, and I'm glad, like you say, we do see the moments of him not being able to, because it then shows us he's not as strong as we think he is, even though he's outside, so everyone else he is. He. This is only four months later, because he then goes and visits some friends um, in Seattle, and he's telling them, you know, how he feels. He says, you know, I... I just, I'm a wreck, really. You know, I'm trying my best to get through it. But I think what I need, like you said earlier, is, is a change of scenery. I'm going to go off. I'm going to go and do make some music. Yeah, he's a composer. Sort of, he's a composer. He's a lecturer of music as well. Mm. Um, and he's very, like, um, accomplished, successful, really. He's well-known. You know, and he's, he's very good. He loves music, very passionate about it. He seems quite relaxed in his career, so I would assume from that he's had a career for quite a long time, like you said, had success, and has got to that point now where he doesn't need to do stuff for pay. It's more for play. Mm-hmm. He says, I want to rent an, uh, somewhere, like an old house somewhere, that I can just play music in, get my piano and play music in. So... Somebody sets him up with a, a lady who, like a letting agent. The, the fucking size of this house. I know. I was like, how much am I paying this caretaker? Because they, they'd be like, oh, don't, no, don't worry, we employ the caretaker. But obviously that must go out of his rent that he's paying them. It must be like, how much that caretaker must be 24-7 walking around his house with a list continually going round and round. <laughs> Fuck that shit. So he's shown around this absolutely huge house, Fucking which needs huge. a lot of work. Music room but, with a grand piano. But he piano. loves it. Mm. Well, exactly. That, and that's what does it for him. He's got a huge piano left there. This movie also, I, I, I think the thing about this I like is also the fact he's a composer there. Have you seen The Blade in the Dark, Lamberto Barber's film? I have, yeah. Same principle. It's a slasher movie, but he's, he's there and he records something and he thinks he hears it and records back and it's a woman being killed. Good movie if you've not seen it. We should probably cover yeah, very it. Very good movie. Mm. He, he moves in, and the next we, shot we see is all his stuff in the house, and he presses the piano key. He's very happy, and as he walks out of the piano room... Yeah, but, so but basically... He just goes... Doom, he's playing it, then we've got Mr. Tuttle, who's the uh, caretaker, um, gives him a shout and says something to him, and he's in the room, and he's just playing piano. There's a dum dum. It's a basically a dead, a dead note, dead key. Dum dum. no sound at all, and he's like, oh, okay walks out and like Dan's just saying then we just see the key bang and it's just like oh it's just such a small little smidgen of a spookiness coming in but that is quite a quite a thing the piano not playing then playing and he doesn't even hear it so it's no, just no, for it's, us the it's, audience it's literally just for us which is not great <laughs> yeah. we then start seeing him he's begun lecturing in seattle and he's very charismatic he gets to the lecture proper big fucking lectures well he says i but was told there's only going to be 23 people at this lecture and there's like hundreds and of they're people. all laughing at everything he says he could fart and they would think he's amazing must m goes to show very brilliantly made film really it go and it's in the writing it goes to show that this characters is very accomplished musician and they've yep. come because he must have almost a little bit of fame obviously this is pre-internet but they must have heard or seen or he's had concerts or, or people, the teachers have been like this dude's coming to lecture here fucking like he's super good we're lucky to have him and then this place is full up yeah, yeah. 
he plays some music for them he, he makes some jokes uh so he's getting he's getting on with his life and he's powering through this grief so he's got his new place he's renting he's got his new job he's lecturing and he goes out for some socializing socializing he goes to a classical he music goes to night concert with his new lady friend i'm gonna call her mrs lady friend or lady friend because she seems I, uh, she seems extremely interested in her does she does she want to well, play george she's well she does her name's claire and she's the one that showed him around the house but she is she really likes him i think it's pretty obvious but she knows he's also recently lost his wife and daughter so you kind of got to wait a little bit really you yeah, don't just come on love chill a little bit you know <laughs> um but yeah he uh yeah he's, he's getting back into every every aspect of life really it's starting to work again for him he gets home he parks his car in the garage I've put here that the house is so gothic because it's raining and thunder and lightning when he gets home and it's just incredibly it gothic. It does look house. really good, yeah. Um, he wakes up, though, in the middle... Well, it's 6 a.m., Gav, doesn't he? Well, just very quickly at the party, she says that she's very glad that he took on the house and we don't have no more about that because nobody's wanted to hire to take this on this house because of it being whatever going on. And he can't figure out what's, go what's going on. But the, no, she doesn't know. No one really knows, you know. But yes, returns back to this creepy fucking house. And what did you say? It's 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. in the morning. He's woken up. Sobbing his eyes out because he's thinking. And we know what. We, we just opened with him sobbing his eyes out. And we know straight away as the audience why he's sobbing his eyes out. He's sobbing his eyes out because of his family and the devastation that's caused. Well, actually, that's not quite yet. But yes, he does all his eyes out um the bit i'm referring to is him waking up at 6 a.m to gigantic thunderous banging no he's sobbing his eyes out and the banging all of a sudden comes in and takes his mind from it and he stops sobbing and i find it really interesting almost like and this is why he starts to think the bangs is sank signaling in him he's because he eventually finds it it's like oh that's what such coincidence my daughter died he thinks it's siblings so straight away then i think he thinks back back to that later on going oh okay it kind of stopped me sobbing it didn't want me crying it put my mind off it because he's sobbing away and bang bang he, but that, but the, <gasps> and he stops but the sobbing is in t about two scenes time no no no, that, no 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 he's sobbing and then the bang stops no no, no he's not he's but he's thunderous banging then he goes down and plays the piano and the creepy door opens behind him and mm -hmm. there's no one there yeah then the janitor shows up and he's like, oh, it must have just been you. Then Claire shows up at the house and they go riding together. And he stops in the middle of the woods with Claire and she's like, are you okay? And he says, I'm really sorry, I'm just thinking about my daughter. Then he wakes up, bawling his eyes out the next morning. So something in the woods with the horse has made him remember his daughter. But you're right, he does wake up that the following morning to the banging. No, 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 no you're, no, you're absolutely correct. That's not even in my notes. So if I follow my notes, I'll be agreeing with you exactly now. <laughs> um, because you said that, I'll just jump to that point. No, you are co completely correct, because there's a banging but, but, in but, the house already. The, it's, the pipes yeah. start up. It's, it's the he next, doesn't it's, really think about the banging that much. It's very much Amityville 2, where there's a lot of banging on the pipes, and they get some of the dirt, and then their face gets melted off by the goo in the pipes. Well, he gets someone around to check his pipes. Get your pipes cleared. <laughs> Come on, gentlemen, we've got to keep our pipes cleared. Sam Elliott had a problem with his pipes in the shower, didn't he? He cleared his pipe everywhere. Um, and then the man comes around, he says, well, look, your furnace is fine. You know, I don't really know what these old houses, they've got habits, they've got funny little things that happen. Don't worry about it too much. It's probably fine. But he's like, well, I don't understand why it's, it's 6am every morning for 30 seconds and then it just stops. And the guy's like, it doesn't matter. The pipes are all fine. I've checked everything. Don't worry about it. He <laughs> thinks, uh, all right, I'm fine. And it is that morning, though, he woke up crying. To it bang. is that morning. That morning just happened before, yes. He does it so um, realistically because he he wakes up crying. Like He just wakes up like, and you can't help it. I did that. The day after my mum died, I woke up and I was already like in the middle of this massive crying. And I was like, what's going on? It kind of scared me a bit because I, I must have started doing it in my sleep. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very realistic thing. I can imagine. Um, I, I find this movie, it's, it's kind of like, this isn't Jack Nicholson is shining, but it's in the same ballpark. But it's a very refined and relaxed uh, 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 approach. Do you know what I mean? He's got some balls. 
Because he's in, he stays in this house with all these weird things that start happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy is fucking hard as fuck has, when it comes down he, to it. He has um, a bunch of what I assume students over to practice some some music, and they're all sort of trying these pieces. And he sort of afterwards he says, "Well, you were a bit slow off the mark on that bit." And he sort of critiques them all. But he says, well, that was very good, though. I really enjoyed doing that with you guys. So, you know, thank, thanks very much. Um, they all leave. There's a thunderstorm. And when they all leave, he hears some sort of... <laughs> giggling from upstairs. And he thinks, what the fuck? Then he finds a tap running. And he thinks, well, that's weird. Then he hears some more strange noises coming from upstairs. that sound like water running. And he makes his way up somewhere that we've never seen him go before, which is the very, very top floor of the house. It, it, th- this shot, um, b- before we get this, but so I can carry on with this, when, just before, when the lady came to visit him, she picked up the ball again, and he, she, oh, that's my daughter, Kathy's ball. And we're just reminded of the ball again. We need to keep saying this because it's such a like, subtle build-up they have in this film for doing stuff like that. Okay, but yes, we're back here, and that shot when he walks up there, I was just looking at going barbarian. It was uh, yeah. the, the film, it, and the way it shot, I actually took a photo of it. I don't know if I put it on the Facebook group. I planned on doing it. The shot going up was gorgeous, and the camera yeah. from a camera's about five feet away from him slowly just walks up the stairs with him, and it's just like, oh, what's up there? What's up there? I know, and he does go right up to the top floor. He's a very he, brave he man. He doesn't give a fuck, does he? Would you? You wouldn't. You would be Alice. Alice, there's a girl up there who fancies me. Get up there. <laughs> Well, he goes up to the top floor, and there's a bath in the top, very top floor bedroom, it's, and, it's and it's creepy, running. A creepy bedroom right up there, he finds, which he didn't know about. And the worst thing is, is that as he sort of turns the tap off and steps back, suddenly an image of a boy, little boy's face is under the water. It is so creepy. Hmm. It's not, like, deformed or anything like that. It's not Jason Voice. It's just a little boy looking out from under the water at him. It's... it's- Quite a bit. This isn't in the. This is just his bathroom. This isn't the sneaky room yet, is it? No, no, we're not in the sneaky room yet. Cool. Yeah, so, and he, he just. And he, I love the way that this is film so been blocked and devised. And obviously, you have to do this for most films, especially then as well. You couldn't go. Oh, it's okay. It's four K. We can just push into it later on. Um, I love the fact that he does a subtle thing. He backs into the camera to black to fade to black. Yeah, it's great. And and then like a real slow static camera look on the film where it just sort of just doesn't. This this camera hardly moves in this movie. It just sits there and like you're on a play and you're just going to sit and watch it. And that's why it's such a subtle way of doing this sort of film. It does feel like a play at times, which that's is a compliment. Of the reason, yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of the best films do. You, you like Hitchcock would do it quite a lot as well. Yeah. Um, he tells Claire about it the next day, and he says, I think I was hallucinating, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, he, he's he's warned by a lady at Claire's house yeah. that the house doesn't want people in it. No. But, and he's thinking, well, what the, what's this crazy lady talking about? The house doesn't want people in it. And yeah, people don't, it doesn't want people to live in it, she says. It doesn't like people. It's not a person, it's a house. What's she talking about? Well, later on that day, he's back outside his house, and suddenly a window smashes from the very top attic room. Yeah. And he looks down and he sees this bit of red sort of stained glass. So so he's out on the driveway of this massive fucking house, and we've got like a real it's got like four, looking four down. levels to it. And wide and deep. Wide and deep, Dan. And... Christ. He doesn't know where the glass comes from, but I love the fact we've got the camera looking down at him from kind of the rooftop looking down where he is, and he's kind of looking at But because it takes a while for him to decide which window it's sort of coming from, it, it makes him kind of look at the house long enough. And at that point, I'm like, is he now questioning, or not even questioning, he's now agreeing with what they're saying, that the house does not want me in here. Because he's just come outside, glasses broken in front of him, and he's looking at going, what window was that? But at the same time, he must be going, that's so weird that the lady said that the house was want people yesterday. And I'm just looking at this house, and I'm like, oh, God, it's fucking creepy as shit. He discovers, though, where that glass comes from, and decides yeah. to go up there. Well, he's a composer, he's creative, and therefore he likes puzzles probably solving mysteries solving investigating so something in his brain makes him want to you know look into this more so he he yeah. read 
red piece of glass came out of that red window. I'm going to go up to that room. I'm okay. going to find out what broke the what broke the glass. So he, he goes up um, and he finds a secret door hidden behind some shelves. It's not good. Well, he rips the shelves down using his George Shoot Scat because he's quite a strong oh, guy. George George Scott. Scott. I always think he looks like. Doors. I don't know who would win in a fight between him and Sam Elliott. How about him and Leslie Nielsen in his bear fighting stage? Yeah, I think my money's on George. Sam Elliott. Uh, I was about to say Liam Neeson knows what am I talking about. Sam Elliott, <laughs> um, Leslie Nielsen, and George C. Scott as a tag team. Taking on a bear. Taking on cocaine bear. Taking on a cocaine bear. I did think I was telling Ren, Ren Canvas to watch it, that's Sarah's daughter, and I was telling her all about Leslie on the way in. I was like, there's this amazing movie where Leslie Nielsen, she's like, who? And like, you know, from the airplane movie. She's like, what? And I, was like, oh. and I was like, he fights a bear, and he's got no top on, and it's in the rain. And she's like, it has to be a real bear. And I was like, I can't remember. <laughs> don't oh, think gosh. so. Well, George C. Scott rips these shelves down and reveals a secret door. Like you said, it's not good. And there's a padlock on this door. Yeah. Somebody doesn't want us looking in this room. But so he, he finds a bit of fucking stainless steel pipe and whatever, starts banging away at it. The pipes start banging away. Then they get in some sort of musical unison rhythm and they're both banging away at the same time. And he's like, and it, it's almost like the ghosts are with him and it's uh, like they've teamed up together to let's break down this door. Well, it's like <laughs> the, 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 the... I do that thing. I don't know why I, I think... went country western then. <laughs> oh boy, let's, let's break, break down, down the door. door. Break down the shelves. Break, break down, down the, the door. Um, I do think the house is sort of communicating with him in that it's sort of saying, yes, this is what I want you to do. I want That's... you to break down this and door. I've, and he at this point does think this is, has to do with his daughter's passing and he's got a purpose because he says this later on. And I love the fact that he starts hearing the banging and they start banging in unison to knock off this padlock. I don't, why do I keep singing? I don't know. Okay. Well, he, go, he manages to break the door in. And it's definitely and got it, all barbarian. And this room is fucking this, creepy. This is the shot I thought was earlier. This is the shot where it's the creepy staircase. And he just goes, I'll just go walking up there. And the camera's like, oh, I don't know if I want to. Oh, go on then. And it's just, if you're watching this late night, dark, loud, even headphones on or something, you'd be like, oh my God, oh my God, don't go yeah. up there. Even though you're George C. Scott and you could probably just chew someone's face off, just don't. He finds this room that's full of cobwebs and strange objects. And a music box. It's not There's crazy. a wheelchair prominently in the middle of the room. It's just, it's just a tiny you, wheelchair. You just need like a little doll, doll as well. Everything is perfectly the creepiest things you could find. He uh, finds the window where the glass came from. Yeah as well so, so he, it's broken from the inside and he feels like well it, it certifies in his head once he finds this music box and the t tune it plays he finds thinks that this was a purpose he was meant to find this place because he opens the music box and it plays a tune that he earlier in the film a couple of scenes before was thought he'd come up with he thought he composed it yeah and he'd recorded it yeah and but he, however, this music box is playing, and this music box has been up here for a long time. And he's like, what the fuck? He feels like he must have channeled it. So she, she, his lady friend, comes round, and it, it, it's great, because he can give her proof. Here's what even, recorded, and here's the music box. Even this plot point alone is so original. Oh, yeah, he thinks the house is trying I to communicate with I absolutely love that he's come up with a tune that he then discovers he didn't come up with. He it's thinks already... he's channeled it from the house. It's great. It's great. Through his art, you know. He gets Claire to come round, and he says, look, I think something is trying to communicate with me. I need to show you this bedroom that I found. Yeah. Um, please come up with me. So they go up there together, and they find a few other objects. They find a tiny wheelchair. Like I mentioned, it's a child's wheelchair. They find a book that's written it from 1909, by a child, like a child's journal, Joseph. And she says to him, look at this tiny wheelchair. What do you think this room even was? Why was there a lock on it? What, what is it? And they walk out of the room and the camera stays in the room, just focuses on that wheelchair for a little bit too long. I don't like it. Again, slowly setting this stuff up for us. Oh. 
Yeah, it's a very well crafted film. Um, so George and Claire begin uh, an investigation now. They start looking into the history of the house. And they find all the records of the owners and the people that live there all the way up to 1920, but they can't find anything before there at this point. And I love it when they go to a library in these earlier films and they use one of those scanners now where they're, they're scrolling through all the cuttings. The old um, newspaper cuttings, because that's the only way of storing them, yeah. And they look at 1909 records and they find a clipping about a child that was hit by a coal cart and died a few days later. Um, so this then means, well, well, hang on, what we'll do here then is uh, we'll we'll go and maybe look into the orphanage. But he starts thinking, hang on, there's a similarity here because my daughter was hit by a car and this girl was hit by a coal car. So he goes down a wrong route. Like you said, he thinks this is his daughter or something to do with his daughter. Mm. There's a slight similarity there, but nothing... You know, so, so they, they look at photo albums of his wife and his daughter together, and, that, and he sort of talks to her about that. And then he goes home. He goes home. This is great. This and, uh, is just like we've just been back brought to up to it. Gigantic house. By himself. Dropped off. See you later. All right, see you later. All by myself. Big, echoey, huge house. Hear, no one in it. You hear a little noise. Imagine that here, you're by yourself in there, but there could be something else here. Yeah. <laughs> look, at the bottom of the stairs, you look up, and the ball, which was your daughter's, is just bouncing down the stairs and lands perfectly at his feet. It's like, oh my god. It, it's really scary. He it's, thinks. It's, <laughs> It's scary because the top of the stairs are all blacked out, so you can't see what's up there. And just the ball, and it's shot so well. And you know he's thinking, is this Kathy? Is this Kathy's ball? So what's? It's just such a good setup. <clears throat> so he does what, again, creative mind, puzzle solving. He takes the ball, he drives away, and he drives to a bridge, and he throws the the ball into the river. Fuck you, ball! I don't want. To, I find it a strange thing to do, but I guess he's doing that because. I don't, I don't know, because if his daughter is trying to get hold of him, throwing her toy away is not a good thing. Surely he must have looked at that as in, that's my daughter trying to get hold of me again. I don't know why he threw it away. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? Because when he gets home, <sighs> the ball bounces back down the stairs, and this time it's wet. Oh, it's actually almost terrifying so it's when ter I watch this it, again. I'd say it is terrifying. Because the score it comes that comes in and it comes right. The camera sits there and the ball comes to the audience's face. It bounces towards the camera. It bounces to you. The score almost feels like someone jumps up behind you and grabs the back of your shoulders I, and shakes you. I didn't hear, 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 even hear the music this time. I was too terrified looking at the visuals of the ball. This also means then that the ball has teleported. So this is bigger than just a ghost. This is like. This goes into interdimensional. Mm -hmm. This is so spooky, and he is now thinking, "All right, okay, <laughs> I'm going to go and talk to a psychic research doctor now." Yeah, who tells so he, him? So he goes to visit Peter Venkman, and so, oh no, sorry. So it basically, says to him, "Get a medium. That's what you need." George the medium. George the medium will come by. He'll do it for free. <sighs> so. He decides, it, like, this movie's just jumping along. Even though you might think this movie's kind of slow, it's not kind of a shining type slow. It moves a lot quicker. Um, but it, straight away then, bang, there's people knocking at the door. He's there with lady friend, and who's the lady with curly hair? That's her friend, is it? I uh, can't remember now, but quite a few people turn up. Well, and no, only two people turn up. It's, it's the medium herself and her receptionist, shall we say, who, who like, kind of... Oh, yeah, the Trent. lady that warned him about the house. No, 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 the man. I'm saying he's like the receptionist of the medium. He, he, he actually saying stuff. He's like oh, yeah, that's going her through husband. it and he's like, okay, her husband. He helps her with the, the seance. Yeah. So you've got the three people there already and the two people turn up. Five. And they sit down to do this seance to find out, you know. He's, he says, "He says, do you mind if I record it?" He's a composer, so he's like, "No, no, of course, please do." Hence, where I got the idea of tape free and stuff. <laughs> so he he presses record and they begin. 
and they do something which you haven't seen in a lot of films, but we've all heard of it if you know anything about horror films, called automatic writing, which mm. is where somebody will... It's cool. Um, take, they will write down messages from a spirit, seemingly like their hand is possessed and just doing it. It'll just be Kevin Bacon's package. That's Kevin all it will Bacon's say. Kevin Bacon's package, then little some crude drawings. And yours will be Sam's bottom. Sam's bottom. Sam's bottom. Um... And so they begin asking questions. Um, they say things like that a child cannot rest um, if it's a child of a spirit. What is your name? She, but the way she says it, she's got such a flat voice. She's going, "What is your name?" She, she, she's under, and and the way she does it, it, it's really monotone and almost robotic. Almost, she's just not. She's just doing the basic words. There's nothing Did you else die like. in this house? And what are you trying to tell us? As she's saying this stuff, she's writing stuff down. Her husband will say stuff out. Yeah. And it's just so creepy the way that he's like, then going, Joseph, and he's just sort of saying these little words very quickly. And she says, well, da, 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 and she's just scribbling, scribbling, scribbling. And he keeps changing the paper for her, doesn't he? <sighs> it's so good. Did you die in this house? So, no. That's probably one of my favourite seance scenes. Do you have a message? Yes. And then it just starts writing, help, 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 and, help. And the man help. repeats and just keeps repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. Like, he, he doesn't have time to stop and think about what he's saying. He's like, help, 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 help. And then we get like a POV of a, almost like there's something floating into the room from behind them. And then the glass flies against the wall and smashes. And they leave, <laughs> as you probably would. Well, we do get a bit, though, uh, where they're saying, uh, will you speak to us? And it's, yes. You, there's, um, well, you, that... that uh, like, yeah, yeah, it comes up when you record, listens to the re-recording. Yeah. Well, uh, they... It says, child, no, and then what's your name? But I'm saying this is what she's writing down. Will yeah. you speak to us? Yes. And then he says, are you a child? No. And it says, what's your name? And writes down, and her husband says, Joseph. So we know that. And what do you, who do you want to contact? And then what, John, and then help, help, help. That's what's done. So, oh, he, very, very quickly. At this point here, though, when it says, I need help, John, help, we cut to the camera doing a POV, you know, your fucking Black Christmas, your Halloween Michael Myers or whatever at the beginning. A POV of the camera coming downstairs, that's walking what I just said. into the room. Sorry, I wasn't there. There's really a POV listening. of a spirit floating into the room behind them. And it's very fascinating that they do this because, yeah, straight away, the, it, it, the directors have uh, decided to use a POV shot, which is quite early on still for, you know, the movie. Halloween would have done just done it and Black Christmas before that. But using that for the spirit coming in. I find that really interesting. Because then immediately the glass smashes. Yeah, and I find it interesting that they said, I need help, and the spirit comes into the room. It's really well done. It's so simple, but it's great. So they leave, and he lights a cigarette. He likes, he loves smoking cigarettes in this movie. And uh, he plays back the tapes. And he listens to the tapes, and he realises that whenever the question was asked, and she wrote down the answer that was read out by her husband, on the tape you can hear a, a voice whispering the answer. What's your name? Joseph. Mm. I, so he, it, he's oh. like, well, I, So he turns it back and he plays, he keeps playing it back and, keeps, and as we do it, it's been recorded louder and louder and louder and comes in louder and louder and we're really hearing it and he's just like, oh my God, you bad old chat. You're sitting in still, you're, he's listening to that in the same house still. Yep. How terrifying that would be. And the, the more he plays it, the more scared I get. I'm like, can you stop rewinding and playing that That's word what I'm over saying, and over again? Louder and louder. Yeah. It's horrible. Um, it keeps saying, Father, Father, Father. It essentially, then, yeah, go on. Then he realises, then he gets a glimpse, a vision, doesn't he, of yeah. what happened to this kid. It's essentially saying, Father killed him drowning in bathtub. Um, it's like, oh my God. And this is a, a appalling scene. Uh, it's uh, uh, when I first watched this as becoming a dad, it was a bit much. Nowadays, I've seen it so many times. Not I want. I wanted to say to you, how was that for you? Yeah, it wasn't great because <laughs> there's essentially a metal bathtub, as there would have been in the early 1900s, mm. and the dad just walks into the room, and the son's like, "Hey, dad!" and he just grabs his son's feet, flips him over, so Pop, his head's under down. the water, and, just takes and out, yeah. leaves him to drain. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the metal banging is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the 
echoing of the, the, the bathtub being hit. That's why the taps are always turning on and off, because he drowned. But, but it's a bit full on if you're a father yourself. <laughs> and uh, he then says, find my body, find my body. And George is wiped out at this point. Obviously, this is a huge... It's probably even just receiving that vision. It's funny, because I do a true crime podcast. Hi, Strangers Podcast, segue. Um, when we see that flashback of him drowning the kid, then he casually, ca- the dad casually walks out, it shows you the mind state of how almost why he did it. And it's, uh, there's two things it could be. It's either it could be anger or mental health. Or, obviously, a fucking... You're a bastard, so three things, really. And we know it's not anger because he just how casually walks out, and I was like, "Oh, okay." And it's good later on we find out more about why he does it, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. But it was interesting to see that and like the choices to make when doing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Mm. Well, he calls Claire, you know, the only person he's the closest yeah, person in his life. He's a bit shocked. And he, he in the middle of phoning her, he just completely faints. Yeah. Um, so she turns up, and uh, he's he's awake by the time she gets there. Yeah, he's in a chair, and she comes into the room crying. I was like, why, why is she crying? It's like, oh, she's been in there listening to the tape. And the tapes are so emotional. I, I'm assuming she's either had the vision as well, or just hearing that on the tapes. You're, hearing, made a, you're hearing a ghost. Imagine if you actually heard a ghost on a tape. You're like, what the fuck? Because she was there. So like she'd be like, yeah. what the fuck? That would literally the neck, your hair's and neck would go, and you'd be like, oh my god, It'd be so scary. He says to her, in my vision, I heard and saw the words sacred and heart. Um, and she says, well, that was the name of an orphanage near here. Um, so the, maybe the boy in this house was murdered in that was an orphan, something to do with that orphanage. Uh, he, he annoys her though, doesn't he? Does he? How does he annoy her? I can't remember the exact reasoning. But he, and she starts going, no, starts raising her voice. And she goes to walk out of the room, like, quite, da, 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 then just stops. Oh, uh, yes, because the score, and I've just got goosebumps now for this scene. This is the scariest bit in the whole. This is scarier to me. Sorry, Kevin, this is scarier than the ball for me. And it's such simple stuff. And they look up, and there's a wheel, an empty wheelchair at the top of the stairs. And this score just comes in. And it is fucking terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and we realise this is the, the, the wheelchair from way upstairs. How's it fucking got there by itself for a start? Oh, my and God. And I think she realises that, and that's why she's so quiet. Yeah, and there's loads of... I, I, I like this movie at this point. Then, so it, it cuts to then going out to the city, and there's loads of real sh- shots of... really low shots of looking up at the city. I, I assume just to uh, emphasise it being a city in big... Uh, uh, you know, buildings and stuff, but yeah, it's really weird. It's well, they start finding out more information about the family. This Joseph kid that was murdered. Um, they realised there was a chance he was potentially switched out <coughs> with an orphan from Sacred Hearts Orphanage. Yeah, and we and we and we have a, the lady, don't we, who was telling him earlier, or well, who's listening? She was kind of involved a little bit earlier. She's like a receptionist. Yeah. Like, she rings up this fella and says to him, uh, "They've been going through the falls," and he's like, "Oh, thanks for letting me know." And it's a bit like, "What's going on here?" Yeah, and uh, they they want they eventually the trail leads to a ranch because he suspects from his visions and from what everything that they found out that this kid's body is in a well on a on a ranch on some land yeah um so they go um uh they start doing more research and more digging and they basically find out that this this ranch this piece of land it's kind of like the mystery of omen isn't it what it is it's that bit where they go yeah they go off and looking yeah and basically, there's a senator, Senator Carmichael, that we saw earlier when he was at the um, classical music night. This senator is is probably a bit dodgy, and he's coming to money at a young age. And we'll find out a bit more about that in a minute. But this land, this ranch, is owned by him. So they go and they they go and visit this lady, Mrs. Gray, who lives in the house, and they sort of say to her, "Look, you're not going to believe any of this, but let me just very quickly tell you that." 
I'm renting a house that is haunted and there's a dead boy spirit that's told me that he was switched out with another boy and his body is somewhere in a well on this land. And she says, she says, okay, I would tell you you were crazy and tell you to get out of my house. However, it's, my it's, daughter... It's so well done, yeah. At the exact time you did the seance, my daughter had a nightmare that a little boy was crawling out of a hole in the floor under her bed and asking for her help. And you're just like, holy shit. Like, it's just so well written, mm, mm. isn't it? This is just thought, like, it's then, such yeah. a great movie. Yeah, you're, oh. where you think you might have written yourself into a corner, they haven't at all. No, it's brilliant. Like, mm. a lesser movie would have really fucked this bit up, but they've done so well with it. Mm. Um, so she says, I assume you're going to want to just tear this room apart. Just give me till tomorrow to think about whether I let you do that. It's, it's quite a thing to let someone come and do in your house, isn't it? Yeah. But she, you know, she says, all right, uh, I guess we could do that. Um, but, but basically, because do- where this is in this particular room, they think the well is in the room. And her daughter has another nightmare, walks through the house and sees the drain boy yet again and screams. So she thinks, you know what, I'm going to let George C. Scott come round here and smash this floor up because that's the second time in a, in a second night in a row my daughter's had a nightmare about a little boy coming out the ground. So Get Sam Elliott here with his buttocks. <laughs> Digging up. You can just jump down on it. So the next day... They start chainsawing through the uh, floorboards and digging down in through the well. And they find a well. And Mrs. Gray's son starts helping out as well. You know, he's, again, a charismatic guy. Why wouldn't you believe George C. Scott about this? You'd let him do it. Um, And they dig down and down and down and down and down. And they finally, he finds a skeleton hand of a child. So the woman's like, I've called the police then. So yep. you, you you have done it. It's not like, yay! It's kind of, oh, we have found a dead body. Let's get the police here. So the police uh, confirm that it's a child's remains. They don't know who. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know more at some point, but we're going to have to shut all this room off. How did you know this was down here? And he just says, well, just sort of, you know, don't worry about it. And when the police leave, Claire says, why didn't you tell them? He's like, what? What? I'm, what am I supposed to do? Tell them that a ghost told me his body was here. They would not believe me at all. Let's just leave it as it is. He decides to go back down the well. But he breaks sort of back into the crime scene. And he climbs down. And we get a bit of an evil dead sort of moment with a little necklace now, don't we? Where it sort of crawls out of the ground. Yeah. And it's a little... Um, uh, like a medallion or a necklace that is given, I, I believe, to a child when they're um, uh, baptised. Mm. And it's got a name in it. It's just um, a reverse shot as well, so it just comes out of the ground rather than comes out the ground. It pulled into the ground, you know. So he, he takes it, and on the, it's got the date of a communion on there. Um, so it's very interesting, very strange. He takes this, and he goes... To tell the senator at the airport. Yeah, because cause the cops are there, like, do, do you know more about it? No, 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 no it's going to light the cigarette and look really sketchy over here. Yeah. So what he's worked out is, is that this Senator Carmichael yeah. isn't really Senator Carmichael. He he obviously is, but... And he ain't got enough proof for this, so he can't go and fucking just throw that out anywhere, especially to the police. Yeah. So he believes that this dead kid, Joseph, is actually should have been living the life that Senator Carmichael is. But what happened is, his dad killed him and then just said, oh, I better get another kid from the orphanage to cover up my crime. And that is who Senator Carmichael is. I kind of wanted that senator to shoot himself I thought in the what, head. I, the first time I saw this, I thought that's what he was going to do. I kind of wanted him to, in a way, um, for the guilt. And he's always suspected, I think, the way it's played, that, that he's not the rightful heir to all this money. Yeah, yeah, where did he come from then? Who was he? He, he was just a kid from an orphanage. And they just fucking picked him up and then just killed oh, But why? Because the original kid had um, a disability. And, oh, and he wouldn't have inherited the money because of the disability. But this, but this guy, so they just said, oh, he was cured while and he was over in, in char- Austria or something. What, that's what they say, yeah. 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 So they he goes to the airport and Senator Carmichael's about to get on his plane. He goes, Senator! 
Senator, I and need to talk to you. Drive up there, just fucking on to, next to the aeroplane. Just, uh, yeah, this is a long time ago. It's definitely yeah. not nowadays. The hustle, they hustle the senator onto the plane and um, get him out of there before he can sort. Of, who was that? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Let's just go go off on my private jet with all my money. And then he holds in his hand, and he's got a very similar necklace to the one that George Scott found. In, in fact, an exact copy of it, but just yeah. slightly different details on it so um he goes back to the house and the banging starts the again do- the jo- doors start really angrily banging and he's pissed what you want from me i've done everything you've asked i know he's thinking i don't understand why what more there could be you know i but they like no you still need to get this the senator to realize it is a bit like fuck off i've done i've, I've basically fucked my whole life up for a ghost i've persuaded a random woman to let me dig up the hole in a child's bedroom and find a skeleton of a child Which then i've gone to want. an airport and screamed at a man right. i almost got arrested yeah. Yeah. about three times you know i've had to have a seance in my house what more do you want from me house but obviously yeah. it's, it's not finished you got a policeman goes to see him because the senator got in a car and used his his car phone to to say get get the chief of police or whatever to give me a call yeah this is um so we know who that is very very good foreshadowing there Ca- captain dewitt his name is and captain dewitt is a bit of an asshole. he's a he's a twit dewitt's he's a been, twit he is he's been told basically to go around there and tell George to drop it and fucking leave it alone. Such a fucking... Feels like it's the BBC or something. So he turns up and he says, right, here we go. Listen, stop bothering the senator just because you apparently have heard a ghostly voice. I've heard all your records, read all the records, yeah. I've seen that you've gone around and got somebody's bedroom dug up and you found, you know, what is this? Is, is it blackmail? Is, it, is that what this is? Yeah, Do you know, want money you know, from the senator? He knows all about him. Yeah. Um, and he says... You've got a gold medal in this house on a necklace, and I won it. A little medallion. He I won bas- it. And he basically says, you've made accusations to the uh, Senate, so, uh, and he will not be blackmailed. And, and George has got like, what the fuck? There's no, I wasn't doing that. I'm not blackmailing, you know. But obviously they're trying to pull this on him. So they say to him... Um, yeah, he wants that medal back. I want that family heirloom back immediately. Yeah. And if you don't give it to me... I'm going to go and get a warrant. And George D. Scott says, I guess you better go and get your warrant then. And I'll be waiting right here for you when you come back. So he's... And and as he's standing there, his lady friend comes in and says, I've had enough of it this morning. Then she notices he's there. The policeman leaves. And she tells him, your fucking lease has gone on the place. Mm -hmm. You're out of it. And I've been fucking fired. Somebody of a higher power, a.k.a. the senator... Wants this yeah. oh corruption yeah yes. so um who looks in the mirror oh uh it's all money isn't it it's always fucking money these cunts it is <laughs> um he looks in the mirror and he has a vision of captain dewitt uh with broken glass yeah and just at that moment oh, the phone omen. rings so omen and Claire says, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he's like, what, what? And she says, that captain that was just at your house, I've just seen him drive past me. And then suddenly the car flipped over and he's dead. He's dead. It's him. I know it's him. It does go to question. If the ghost did this, why can't the ghost just kill the fucking senator, which he does do? Why doesn't the ghost just kill the senator anyway, ages ago? I love this next scene because I hate the senator. So I love it when he gets, he lands and he says, yeah. <sighs> Hopefully everything's taken care of, and he's got a phone call. Oh, yeah. a message from Captain Dewitt. And he's oh. like, "Oh, good, good. I wanted that report from him. What, what, what happened?" And they're like, "He's dead." Oh. And he's like, "Oh, shit." So, right. so, I better have a meeting with George C. Scott then. Yeah, this ain't good. So uh, he meets with George, and it's- George. <clears throat> George is just playing the cards and he even not he doesn't even hide the necklace lays the necklace out in front of him to say there you go there's your necklace you cunt but fucking hell don't you think that's a bit weird that your copper friend came to visit me now he's dead this is you know and he says you're the changeling but the whole time he's going the sentence going what do I do here here's my checkbook what do, what name your price and he's like no you, you fucking stop trying this you know what's going on so the changeling, for anyone who doesn't know, is um, like a, a mythical 
creature, which is essentially a child, is replaced with a copy of it, but it's an evil copy of it or a different copy of it. And, and it's, it's so nicely done because you find out the changeling isn't like um, an actual creepy monstery kid or something. It's this it, it's guy. A senator. It's a He's senator. Changing. And I thought that's, it's almost like a metaphor for it or whatever. I don't know. It's really good. He says, none of the money belongs to you. I don't want anything from you, but I just want you to know that I know. He says you're fake. This doesn't belong to you. Yeah. And that's what I wanted that like, dude to commit suicide at that point. He says, here's all your files. Here's a copy of the ta seance tape. I don't have any other copies of it. Yeah, and he says your father was a murderer. And he gets yep. very upset by that. He was a lovely man. He was a kind man. He's got a picture of his dad on his desk, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, which... Uh, yeah. When he goes and puts that necklace on that picture. And back at the house, Claire goes in, and uh, the door opens by itself. And, and he says to him, don't there. tell anybody this, or you'll get hurt. What a... Yep. A cat. With a capital C. So Claire's walking around the house. She hears some whispers. Um, she goes running around up to John... John, and she's walking around. Don't run around that house because yep. the wi the wheelchair starts chasing her. It does. Oh my god! It's and so it, scary. She got there all of a sudden. The wheelchair what? just moves. Then just How starts chasing her. How can it be so her? scary? How can it when an empty wheelchair be this scary? Just starts. It's loud and it starts chasing her, and she's just freaking the fuck out. And those old wheelchairs are all sort of rickety, and they look like torch devices, don't they? You know. Mm. And it, yeah, it chases her. She falls down the stairs. It rolls down the stairs, almost hits her as well. George is there though, and the chandelier starts to shake. And then a fire just erupts on the fucking, uh, 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 the handle banister. banister going all the way down, just lights up, comes all the way down. But then, at this point also, the senator has put the, the necklace over the picture of his dad, and the table, he's just looking at the picture, the table just starts vibrating and moving so much. And all of a sudden, he's astro-projected on mm -hmm. the top floor or the first floor of the house, which is totally on fire just walking towards like the the other room and it's just like what the fuck and george, and george can see him. yeah george can see him i'm not sure if claire can but george definitely sees again, him again this goes back to you saying about the ball being wet and coming back it's astro project projection with ghosts yeah. and shit it's very um you don't get this a lot with these oh, no. like, obviously we covered poltergeist which had an element of teleportation in there between yeah, that's dimensional yeah, but this is like, this, this is, is, this is covering this some is, new ground, and it's very interesting. On Earth, the te teleportation, although. It's what makes this movie stand out a bit, mm. these extra things, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, they, George, they leave the house, and she's just hysterical, as you'd imagine. He goes back. Why does he go back? Uh, he goes back in... What for? I can't remember why he goes back in. I wouldn't have gone back into a spooky house. He says, he says to he saw, wait in the car. Is it because he saw old, you know... Oh, yeah, I think oh, it dude. is, because he, he runs back in and he shouts, Joseph! He... And then the house just starts going crazy, and it knocks George back over the banister, and that's where the fire really kicks in. And, and I was like, why are you trying to hurt George? He's helped you, you've ruined his life, <laughs> pretty much, and he's been trying to help you. Why are you trying to kill him? But the senator then is back in his office, and he has seen a vision of the drowning, and he knows it's all true. And he knows that he isn't the rightful heir. And he knows that his dad was a murderer and wasn't really his dad. And he has a heart attack. He clutches his chest and has a heart attack and dies there and then on the spot. Hmm. And Claire and George are back at his... I, off, don't, off. I don't feel it's good enough justice for him. But George and Claire see him being loaded into an ambulance with a sheet over his head. I'm wrong. I'm saying justice for him. you got to think about this. This is a little orphan kid who possibly might have ha gone on to not, maybe not have a very good life or something. He was taken out of the orphanage and just given the wealth and everything like that. He actually didn't do a fucking thing wrong, did he? Well, he knew. He, he, he suspected. He, he kept the lie, but what would you do if you were in that situation, well, though? If yeah, you, but he you know, kept all that money. It should have gone to charity. All that money... I suppose you know, if you knew that, then yeah, he's a bit of a twat. Maybe but keep a bit of I don't the money feel yourself. like you know. I'm trying to think now: is this orphan kid getting a chance? And like, oh my god! Like well, that first time of being in this orphanage with no one, no family, and then all of a sudden like this, like whoa. Maybe keep a bit of the money for yourself, but give like ninety-five percent of it to charity. Yeah. 
yeah, sure that the spirits would be all right with that. He's not really a bad person, I feel, I'm looking at it now. You know. What's what's really interesting is they, they see him loaded into the ambulance and then the the house is now just a pile of ashes in the morning. It's not even there anymore, is it? No. It's just a giant pile of ashes. Apart from the wheelchair, it's just sort of sitting there with smoke coming off of it. Chilling. Chilling out. And then as the camera pans down, the music box opens and... The music box Oh, my God. Rest in peace, Joseph. That is the end of the film. Wow. So, what I'm going to... What I'll try to and... George C. Scott after that? Jesus yeah. Christ. Did he have to go on holiday again and to start another life to get over that tragedy? Yeah, he went to... Fucking uh, hell. Poor, poor, you don't see what happened to him. Poor George C. Scott. He, him and Sam Elliott went on holiday to the UK and they went to a mansion. Um... What I'm going to no, try and explain no, about this Bogdan movie... Regis. What I'm going to try and explain about this movie is, if I'd have seen this many, many years ago, mm. um, I'd still feel the same as I do, only having seen it a couple of years ago for the first time. It is probably in my top five scariest films of all time. Oh, well done. Well, I thought you could say Haunted House movies, but yeah, great, well done. Oh, uh, the Poltergeist... Um, sorry, uh, The Exorcist is... For me, it's one of the scariest films of all time. I, I couldn't name them now, but this is definitely in the top five. The Changeling, just just for those couple of scenes with the ball in the wheelchair, but the rest, the, the rest of the film, the, the séance scene, it get where it gets under your skin. It's a masterpiece. I'm going to say this is a masterpiece mm. in, in in horror film, but really intelligent, classy horror film. Yeah, Do you know what I mean, yeah, I need to pick up a Blu-ray for my uh, collection. Um, if it's a you, wonderful film. If you've not seen it, you can still, you know, go and watch it. We, obviously, we've spoiled it, but if you just shut off everything that we said and just turn the lights off and just go, I'm going to watch a movie, get some popcorn or whatever, I think you'd be into it if you want a haunted house movie and you've never seen it. And it's actually quite a complex plot. It's, well, it's yeah, not just a standard... concentrate on it as well, yeah. yeah uh, and, and I would even say, like, you, like, I've seen it probably three or four times now, mm. and I'm just starting to unpiece little bits here and there. Like, you've only just figured out that the, the change thing refers to the senator, which is, you know, really... really and yeah. I guess I didn't know that the first couple of times. It, it is just one of those things that the more you watch it, the more you get out of it, really. I let Jay watch it last year, so, like, in the daytime, she, she was just here with me. Um, loved it really liked it and uh, she's good like that she can watch old films and appreciate it but yeah she really liked it yeah I, I mean I would like to give this film I probably would give it like an 8.5 to a 9 out of 10 mm. Mm. It's, it's awesome it's really awesome yeah I'll give it 8 out of 10 yeah it's a good movie um, really good stuff well thank you for that Kev yeah amazing stuff um, well we've got the rest of your email to read out so what we'll do is we'll have a little break, come back for our outro, re finish up your email, do our general sort of housekeeping and um, get the F out of here, like they say. And we're back again. Back again, back again. Thanks so, for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. And thank you to our king patron of the episode, Kevin S. Fife. Do like, comment and share and all that jazz. Um, yeah, let us know what you thought. We have got the rest of your email to read out, and then we'll wrap up. So, um, after his uh, descriptions of the movies, he finishes his email with, Honestly, I just hold both of these films in high regard with the connection of my father and our many movie moments. At a time when I was growing into a super fan of the genre, I saw these at the ages of 9 and 10. Formative, he writes. <laughs> Um, I am excited to hear how you both feel about these two favourites of mine. Um, so we absolutely love them, especially The Changeling. I really like Legacy as well, though, but The Changeling is just a standout movie. It really is. Yeah. Um, he finishes with, Thank you for being you. Thanks for allowing me to be part of that, and thanks for letting me share my love of horror with you both. Yeah. I do get to the UK from time to time, so next time maybe we can share an in-person chat. I'd love that. I'd absolutely love that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he says, Until then, stay away from sinister mirrors, cobweb-filled attics, chicken bones, and Republican senators. Signs Kevin S. Five. P.S. I miss you saying the patrons' names in various voice styles. Just saying. Ooh. P.P.S. 
I'm not sure if this was the longest email read aloud, but I was going for that. Oh, well, good. I'm glad you're th- going for it. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. I think, uh, Kevin, I think this might, yours might be the longest we've ever had. <laughs> uh, uh, of the patrons, but I remember Brian did a very long email when we were talking about dog soldiers, and he was telling us about how he found the script. Oh, no, he no, he actually recorded that, didn't he? That wasn't the yeah. email. I think out of all the patron emails, um, Kevin's is the longest. Insert penis joke here. I yep. think I said that to him in a private message as well. Um, but yeah, uh, amazing uh, double bill there, Kevin. Yeah, really um, good. Thank you for that. Um, uh, and, uh, great, I, great, great to talk about the change in really. And as well. I'm glad you like the podcast. So yes, thank you. thank you. So there we go. That was episode 134 of the podcast on Haunted Hill. Fantastic. Another Patreon episode in the bag. Should we see what's coming up next? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so episode 135 will be our... Which we might be together. Uh, probably be the one after that. And we will have to see. Episode 135 is our Invisible Man episode. We're going to be looking at the original Invisible Man from 1933. James Whale directing. Second James Whale film we've covered. And Hollow Man will also be in that episode. Kevin okay. Bacon, back again. Hey. Bacon back again. Uh, that means episode 136 is our Easter special. Leprechaun 5 in the hood and Leprechaun 6 back to the hood. Yep. Excited for that, you guys? Great. And that means episode 137 yes. will be will be my birthday episode. And I'm happy to, uh, and I'm Kevin yeah, will be I don't, happy. I, I don't know what you're doing. What are you doing? Well, two slashers. Okay. Uh, yeah. Related to both April and my birthday. I know, I know one of them. Yeah, so happy birthday to me from 1981. And April Fool's Day. And April Fool's Day from yeah. 1986. Cool, uh, man. Cool, cool. Some cool slashers with a similar sort of plot line, maybe, um, but it'd be interesting to compare them and talk about them. Um, I really like those two movies, so... So, we have to try and get out of that other episode, then that means we can actually do the Easter episode on Easter Sunday together. And I, we've, we've not been together to record a podcast for... Like four, three, five, three no, four no, years? No, no, longer. Maybe well, four, bloody, four yeah. or five years, possibly. Um, so we, uh, we, I'll set you up with your own microphone, and you'll be like, "Oh, you won't be able to move around like you do with your little headset." You got to be like me. Warwick Davis and will be the reason that we are together. I can't believe that it's actually quite a funny one to have because <laughs> it's those movies. Uh, you know, being together for those would actually be quite funny. Yeah, I agree. Mm. It'd be good, good mm. stuff. And um, we're also going to try and record a couple of commentary tracks. I think we could watch a couple of our favourite films and do, do a couple of little commentary tracks to drop out once in a while. Yeah, maybe to our patrons and then maybe for My, I think we do. Uh, another I episode further down the line. Yeah, I think so. Good stuff. Yeah, totally. I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, yes. So, yeah, that's the next three episodes. Lots coming up, lots of fun stuff coming up. Gavin and I are going to actually meet up for a long weekend as well, like we said. Well, that's because we're shooting the Star Wars films. We're yeah. shooting Star and you, Wars. You're, you can actually be on crew this time. Yep, yep. Um, so, excellent. Well, let's do some admin, and then we can uh, say our goodbyes, blow our kisses, and kiss Sam Elliott's ass goodbye. Okay? Yep. All right. Well, as always, we are the podcast on Haunted Hill. You've been you've been listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. Should always do that. We're a proud member of pa- of uh, Patron. A proud member of Legion Podcast Network. You can find out more about the network on legionpodcast.com. Uh, you can find us. You can email us on the podcast on Haunted Hill at outlook.com. Uh, we're on Facebook as is Legion. Just go to Legion Podcast or go to the podcast on Haunted Hill. They both have a page each. That's where we're most active. That's where our big community is. That's where you can join us, chat to us, message us, or you can email us on the address I mentioned just now. Wherever you're listening to us now is where you can continue to listen to us, but we are on Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, Podcast Addict, and many other podcast platforms. You can message us on Twitter, at Haunted Podcast. We're on Instagram, at the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. 
Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about Star Wars Sanctuary Moon, another de- anything else that Deadbolt is doing, or just you know just want to find out more about Deadbolt films, visit our website deadboltfilms.com. Uh, we have a chat YouTube channel, Deadbolt Films. Um, and we're on Instagram, Deadbolt Films, or one word. And we're on Twitter, at Deadbolt Films. And yep. finally, if you want to support us through Patreon, which we do have people doing, and we really appreciate you guys that do that, then all you need to do is visit Patreon and search for the podcast on a Haunted Hill. If you can't find that, just message me, um, and I will point you in the right direction or send you a link. Um, and you don't have to do it. We don't ask that anyone does it. We would do this for free and did do this for free for many many years and anything that we are that people would want to donate goes towards us renting or buying obscure movies or paying for um equipment along the way and just really helps to to keep the show moving along really because sometimes you gotta pay for stuff and it costs money doesn't it gav absolutely every once in a while we do need to uh um chip in for some equipment here and there and things like that. And also, um, uh, the, the odd movies we have to uh, uh, watch where we can't get hold of certain ways. Like, before I've had to buy, buy box sets of random films, I'm like... Doug McClure. Can, yeah, Doug McClure. I had to buy a Doug McClure box set because I was like, I cannot find these films anywhere. <laughs> and I had to like get that in and even had to change our time of date of uh, podcasting because I couldn't do it. So yeah, thanks for very patrons. You, you, we love you guys to bits. Uh, if you become a patron, you do get a t-shirt uh, in one of three colours in your size. Or if any you're size in America, you, you get a t-shirt at some point. Yeah, sorry about that, Don. <laughs> it is going to find its way it, to It's it packaged point. over there. <laughs> I'll probably see it, you know. Um, you also get to have your own Patreon episode uh, in rotation, uh, where you pick the two movies, like Kevin did for this episode. Tell us why you want us to review these movies, etc. Uh, and you get exclusive content, like older episodes dropping every Friday, and occasionally we drop um, just exclusive random episodes or videos onto our patrons' um, e- inboxes as well. So, as always, we want to thank our patrons individually by name and as requested by Kevin, I will do this in a silly voice for each one. Do it. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much to Don Collier, Matthew Godley, or Jeremy Jenkins, Kevin S. Fife, Sarah Kay, Rachel, RJ McCready, and finally, Lax Burr. There we go, Kevin. That was the silliest Very voices good. I could muster. So thank you guys for supporting us in your patronage. We love you all very much. Thank you to everybody for listening and supporting and liking and commenting and just being with us as we approach our 10-year anniversary of podcasting, which is crazy. Um, thank you to the Legion for continuing to host us all these years. And uh, just thank you to Gav for being my bearded brother in arms. Hi, hey, thank you very much. You too. I don't know what language that was. Accent. Um, his language was English. Um, yeah, thank you very much for coming along and listening to us as always. We love you all. Um, do stay with us. We'll be back again real soon as always, won't we? And we will indeed. Do, uh, do uh, lock those doors and windows. Check under the bed. Look in the cupboard. It's a good night from Sam Elliott's buttocks. Good night from my buttocks. Smashing shit. I'm smashing shit with my buttocks. Look at me. <sighs> yep. It's a good night from George C. Scott's uh, ashtray full of a thousand cigarette butts. I'm smoking them. I don't <laughs> care. And it's a good night from Roger Daltrey choking to death on a chicken bone. <laughs> I didn't even order the chicken, <laughs> god damn it. I ordered a ham sandwich like Sharon Stone. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Big ol' ham sandwich. Good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.